Dial A for Aunties By Jesse Q. Sutanto Part 1 Girl Meets Boy There might be insta-love and also someone might die. We'll see. 1. Present Day I take a deep breath before pushing open the swing doors. Noise spills out, a cacophony of Mandarin and Cantonese, and I step aside so Ma can walk inside before me. It's not that I'm being nice I mean, I am, but I'm also being sensible. Ma grew up in Jakarta's Chinatown, a place heaving with people, and she knows how to make her way through a crowd. Any crowd. If I'm the one leading the way, I'd be squeaking, excuse me oh, sorry, are ye um, could I just I have a reservation my voice would never be heard above the din, and we'd be stuck outside the restaurant forever. Or at least until the dim sum rush died down, sometime around 2 p.m. As it is, people surge behind Ma as she sides a path through the throng of families waiting for their tables, and I would have lost her if I wasn't keeping a death grip on her arm as if I'm all of three years old. She doesn't bother stopping at the front desk. She strides in as if she owns the place, eagle eyes scanning the large dining hall. How can I describe the chaos that is a dim sum restaurant in the heart of San Gabriel Valley at 11 a.m.? The place is filled with close to a hundred round tables, each one occupied by a different family, many of them with three to four generations of people present there are grey-haired, prune-faced Amars holding chubby babies on their laps. Steaming carts are pushed by the waitresses, though if you called them waitress they'd never stop for you. You must call them a ye auntie and wave frantically as they walk by to get them to stop. And once they do, customers descend like vultures and fight over the bamboo steamers inside the cart. People shout, asking if they've got sumai, or ha gao, or lo my guy, and the ayes locate the right dishes somewhere in the depths of their carts. My Mandarin is awful, and my Cantonese non-existent. Ma and the aunts often try to help me improve by speaking to me in either Mandarin or Indonesian, but then give up and switch to English because I only get about 50% of what they're saying. Their grasp of the English language is a bit wobbly, but it's a heck of a lot better than my Mandarin or Indonesian. It's yet another reason why I find it extra hard to order food at Dim Sun. More often than not, everything good is gone by the time the IE notices me and understands my order. Then all that's left is the lame stuff, like the doughy vegetarian dumplings or the steamed bok choy. But today, ah, uh, today is a good day. I managed to get my hands on two lots of hagao, something that Big Aunt will certainly appreciate, and I even get hold of lop chung bao Chinese sausage rolls. Almost makes the whole ordeal of coming to weekly dim sum worth my while. Big Aunt nods her approval when the IE puts the bamboo steamers down in the center of our table, and I feel an almost overwhelming need to beat my chest and crow. I got those shrimp dumplings. Me. Eat more, Medi. You should keep your strength up for tomorrow, Big Aunt says in Mandarin, plopping two pieces of braised pork ribs on my plate while I carefully place dumplings on everyone else's plates and pour them tea. Second aunt cuts the char su bows into two each and places one half on everyone's plate. The table being round means all the dishes are equally within reach of everyone, but Chinese family meals aren't complete without everyone serving food to everyone else, because doing so shows love and respect, which means we all need to do it in the most attention-seeking way possible. What's the point of giving big aunt the biggest su mai if nobody else notices? Thank you. Big aunt, I say dutifully, placing a fat hagao on her plate. I always reply in English no matter which language my family is speaking because second aunt says listening to me struggle through Indonesian or Mandarin makes her blood pressure rise. You eat more too. We're all counting on you tomorrow. And you, second aunt. The second biggest hagao goes on second aunt's plate. Third biggest goes to fourth aunt, and the last remaining one goes on Ma's plate. That shows that Ma has brought me up well, to look out for others before ourselves. Big Aunt waves off my platitudes with a heavily jeweled hand. We are all counting on each other. Heads of big coiffed hair nod. Fourth Aunt has the biggest hair, something that Ma is always complaining to me about in private. 
Always such an attention hole, Ma said once, which was equal parts horrifying and hilarious. I asked her where she heard attention hole, and she claimed that she heard it from our neighbor auntie lying, which is such a lie, but I've had 26 years of living with Ma and I know better than to argue with her. I simply told her it's attention ho, not hole, and she nodded and muttered ho, like ho 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 before going back to chopping scallions. Okay, big aunt says, clapping once. Everyone sits up straighter. Big aunt is older than second aunt by 10 years, and she basically raised her sisters while nine I went to work. Hair and makeup. Second aunt nods, bringing out her phone and putting on her glasses. She uses her index finger to tap on it, muttering, Apa YA, the name of that app Medi make me use for hairstyle. Pin something. Pinterest, I pipe up. I can help you find it. Big Aunt shoots me a stern look, and I wilt. No, Medi. You mustn't help. If Second Aunt can't find the app tomorrow when she's with the bride, we will lose face for sure. We're supposed to be professionals, she says. Or at least I think that's what she says. She's speaking so fast I find it hard to follow, but I definitely caught the Mandarin words for lose face a favorite phrase of hers. Second aunt's mouth purses, and her left cheek twitches a little. Just as fourth aunt irritates the crap out of Ma, second aunt and big aunt have a lot of friction between them. Don't ask me why, maybe it has to do with being the two oldest. Maybe it's something in their complicated pasts. There's been a lot of drama with my mom's family, especially back in Jakarta. I've heard bits and pieces over the years, mostly from Ma. Ha! Second Aunt Crows, brandishing Pinterest on her phone as if it's a sword she's just managed to pull out of a stone. I got it. This is the style that the bride chose. I practiced on Medi's hair and it looked wonderful. She turns to me and switches to English. Medi, you got photo I take of your hair. I do, I say, quickly taking out my phone. I call up the picture and second aunt holds it side by side with her phone, showing off the two pictures to everyone. Whoa, Ma says. It's so similar to the models. Very good, uh, a yeah. Second aunt gives her a warm smile. Fourth aunt nods and replies in English, yes, they're nearly identical. How impressive. Her English is the best of all of theirs, yet another thing Ma will never forgive her for, even though Ma's English is better than her older sister's. Ma insists that fourth aunt has a punching for using big words, i.e., anything with more than two syllables, just to needle Ma. I think Ma might have a point there, but it's just one of the many truths we will never know. The curl not show up well with Asian hair, Big Aunt says. The fact that she's speaking English means she's half directing the admonishment at me. My insides writhe with guilt, even though this is very definitely not my fault. Why you choose blonde hairstyle? Second Aunt Glowers. I didn't choose. The bride choose. Customer always right, remember. She stabs her hargao and bites it angrily. Ham. Big aunt sighs. Should have tell her it looked different on Asian hair than on blonde hair. But, she adds, when second aunt looks about ready to burst, never mind. Too late now. Moving in. On, fourth aunt says. A. Big aunt says. On. It's moving on, not moving in. Moving in is what you do when you move houses. Moving on. Okay. Big Aunt smiles at Fourth Aunt, and Fourth Aunt beams back so hard she might as well be a kid again. Ma says Fourth Aunt is Big Aunt's favorite because she's the baby of the family, and she was such a needy baby that she stole Big Aunt's heart right out of her chest. She snatched it right out, Ma has grumbled many times. I didn't bother asking if Ma, as the second youngest sister, had been Big Aunt's favorite right up until Fourth Aunt was born. Flowers? Big Aunt says in Mandarin once more. I relax a little. Ma's back straightens. All taken care of. 
lilies, roses, peonies. Our Guan will take everything to the island in the morning. The island she's talking about is Santa Lucia, a large, privately owned island off the coast of Southern California that boasts pristine golden beaches, dramatic cliffs, and, as of a month ago, one of the most luxurious, exclusive resorts in the world the Iona Lucia. Tomorrow is the start of a two-day wedding weekend extravaganza for Jacqueline Wajoya, daughter of Indonesia's largest textiles company, and I kid you not Tom Cruise. Satopo, that is. Yeah, the groom's name really is Tom Cruise Satopo. I checked. It's exactly the kind of thing Chinese Indonesians love naming their kids after famous people and or brand names, I have a cousin named Gucci, who moved very far away as soon as he was legally able to, or some form of misspelling of a popular western name. Also case in point, Madeline. My parents were aiming for Madeline. Growing up, my cousins called me Medlin Medlin, which is why I never, ever meddle in anyone's business, ever. Well, that and also the fact that my mother and aunt's meddle enough for the whole family. Anyway, Tom Cruise Satopo's parents own something. Something large. Palm oil plantations, coal mines, that kind of thing. So it's a wedding between two billionaire families in a newly built resort, which is why Big Aunt and all the rest of us are understandably nervous. How we manage to land these people as clients, I have no idea. Well, I do. Fourth aunt's husband is let me get this straight Jacqueline's cousin's father-in-law's brother. So we're practically relatives. Everything in Chinese Indo culture is like that, everybody is somehow related to everybody else, and deals happen because somebody's in-law knows someone else's friend's cousin. I thought that our cheesy as hell company motto, which big aunt is supremely proud of don't leave your big day to chance leave it to the chans. Would have scared away the bride and groom, but they actually found it funny. Said it made them even more certain that they wanted to hire us to cater their big day. Ma rattles on about how she's managed to get the rarest flowers. The arrangements are going to look what do you say in English, Medi? Exqueezed. You mean exquisite. Fourth aunt says, and Ma gives her the deadliest side-eye in the history of all side-eyes. Very good, Big Aunt says hurriedly, breaking the radioactive glares between Ma and Fourth Aunt. And last one, songs, all okay? Fourth Aunt's face goes from icy glare to satisfied smirk. Of course, the band and I have been practicing night and day. People keep coming by the studio to listen to me sing, you know. There are two versions of Fourth Aunt's life story. Version 1 has to do with her being a celebrated child prodigy with a voice that newspapers described as angelic and a national treasure. She was well on her way to stardom, but chose to leave it all behind when all her sisters decided to move to California. Version 2 has her as a SOSO singer who cunningly convinced her entire family to uproot themselves and move to California so she could pursue her pipe dreams of breaking out in Hollywood. One version is fourth aunt's, the other is Mars. And the cake? Second aunt says, side-eyeing big aunt. Our centerpiece needs to be perfect, unlike that unfortunate thing you made for Mokta Halim's daughter's wedding. She gives a dramatic sigh. Nobody has a face anymore. Hem, that can't be right. I pass the words slowly in my head. I think she's saying Big Aunt has made all of us lose face. I really need to brush up on my Mandarin. Anyway, the point is, Second Aunt has made a really low blow. Sheris Halim's wedding is her favorite topic, because Sheris had requested a fiendishly tricky cake of five-layer upside-down tower, with the bottom layer as the smallest one and the top as the biggest. Big Aunt, with years and years under her belt as head pastry chef for Ritz-Carlton Jakarta, was confident she could do it. But something went wrong. I don't know what, maybe she didn't build enough structural support, or maybe it was just an impossible task for a beach wedding in the middle of a SoCal summer. Whatever it was, amid the guests' horrified gasps, the humongous tower had leaned over in slow motion before collapsing on one of the flower girls. It was the only time we'd ever gone viral, 
and second aunt hasn't let big aunt forget about the incident since. Big aunt's nostrils flare. I'm just here to buy soy sauce. Okay, that definitely can't be right. I lean toward Ma and whisper, why is big aunt talking about buying soy sauce? TCH, Ma says. This is why I always say to you, pay attention in Chinese class. Big aunt is saying to second aunt to mind her own business. Thank you for being so caring, my my, big aunt is saying. Phew, she's really mad now. She only refers to the rest as my my little sister when she wants to remind them who's the eldest. Of course everything is ready. The cake will be perfectly fine, please don't worry about me. She gives second aunt a smile that I can only describe as so sweet it's deadly and then turns her attention to me. I shift in my seat. Big aunt, like her title, is larger than all her sisters. I guess 20 years as a pastry chef will do that to you. She wears her size well, and it makes her more majestic, more convincing. There's a reason she's the one who meets with potential clients. I hate the thought of disappointing Ma, but the thought of disappointing Big Aunt actually keeps me up some nights. Maybe it's the result of spending most of my life in the same house as my mom and her sisters. Ma and I only got to move into our own place a year ago after the family business started turning a steady profit. We all still live in the same neighborhood, a mere ten-minute walk away from one another, and I feel the weight of their expectations, as if I have for mothers and all of their hopes and dreams have been placed on my shoulders. I'm basically driven by a mixture of caffeine and familial guilt. Big Aunt turns to face me, and my spine straightens instinctively. Maybe she senses how nervous I am about tomorrow because she gives me an encouraging smile and switches to English for my sake. Medi, everything okay with camera, why eh? You ready for big day? I nod. I checked and rechecked my camera, my backup camera, and all five of my lenses yesterday. They'd all been sent for a maintenance and proper clean-up weeks ago, in preparation for this wedding. I hate that the documenting of my family's hard work big aunt's towering cakes, Second aunt's complicated hairstyles and flawless makeup artistry, Ma's gorgeous flower arrangements, and fourth aunt's dynamic performances all falls on my shoulders. Every wedding, I try to capture everything, and every wedding, I miss something. Last wedding, I forgot to take pictures of fourth aunt from her good side, the one that makes me look twenty again, and the wedding before that, I failed to capture the centerpiece at table seventeen which was apparently significantly different from all the other centerpieces. My geese in perfect condition, I assure them, and I've memoized the list of pictures I need to take for our social media. You good, filial girl, Medi, Big Aunt says, and I force a smile. Ah, filial piety, the foundation of Asian parenting. From ever since I can remember, I've been taught to put my elders that is, Ma and the aunties above everything. It's the reason why I, out of seven kids in my generation, am the only one involved in the family business, even though I desperately want out. For their sake, I pretend to love all of it the fuss and the huge production and everything but it's slowly eroding what I love about photography. For months now, I've toyed with the idea of leaving the wedding business, of going back to what I love about photography to be able to take my time play around with different lenses and lighting and angles instead of rushing to take photo after photo of the same stuff. Not that I can ever reveal any of this to my family. Yes, you are a good, filial girl, Ma chirps in Indonesian. Ma and the aunties are equally fluent in Mandarin and Indonesian and switch seamlessly from one language to the other. She's smiling really wide. Oh. Why is she smiling? That's why we have a surprise for you. Now all of my aunts are grinning down at me. I shrink back in my seat, the sumai in my mouth turning to stone. What's going on? I say, my voice coming out even smaller than usual with my family. Ma says, I found the perfect husband for you. At the same time, all of my aunts say, surprise. I blink. Sorry, you found what now? Perfect husband. Mark Rose. 
I look over my shoulder, half expecting some guy Ma has probably ambushed at the Ranch 99 market to come up behind me. Aya, he's not here, silly girl, Ma says. Is he tied up in the trunk of your car? Don't joke, Medi, big aunt tuts. Your mama is doing all of this so that you can have a good life. I nod, contrite. I'm an adult and yet all it takes is a single admonishment from Big Aunt to make me feel all of three years old again. Sorry, Ma. But I don't. Don't but this but that, Ma says. Why is it so difficult to get you to date? I tried setting you up with Uncle Awai's son, but no, you didn't let me. I tried setting you up with my lily supplier, Aguan Aguan is very handsome, you know but you refused that too. Didn't even want to meet him. Medi is probably cautious because last time when you tried to set her up with Wang Xixiang's son, he turned out to be, you know, fourth aunt says. Ma waves an irritated hand. Why do you keep bringing up Xixiang's son? So he turned out to be some maniac. How was I supposed to know? Kleptomaniac, I mumble. By the time our date was over, He'd stolen my makeup bag from my purse and, somehow, one of my shoes. I mean, the guy's an asshole, but you've got to give it to him. Or let him steal it. Anyway, Sayanku, Ma says, using the Indonesian term of endearment she saves for really special occasions, like the day I graduated from Ukla, this guy is so good. I'm telling you, no one is better than him. He is so handsome so kind, and so smart. And. Oh God, here it comes. The final nail in the coffin. What is it going to be this time? With my luck, he'll turn out to be a second cousin or something. He's the hotel owner. Fourth aunt cries. Ma glares at her. I was just going to say that. You stole my thunder. You were taking too long. Fourth aunt says. They all turn back to me, grinning expectantly. Ah. Uh. I put down my chopsticks. I mean. Am I supposed to be happy about that? It sounds like a huge liability. Do I have to give you guys a refresher course on how bad I am at dating? What part of this is a good idea, exactly? Ah, uh, Ma says, smiling smugly. I know you're not so good at dating. It's because you're such good girl, Big Aunt says, loyally. Second Aunt nods. Yes, you're not a whore, that's why you're so bad at dating. Auntie? Can we not slut shame women, please? She shrugs, not contrite in the least. Anyway, Ma says, it doesn't matter. It's okay that you're terrible at dating because this boy, oh, he is so in love with you, Medi. He knows all your flaws and how awkward you are in person and everything, but he says it makes him like you even more. Whoa, whoa, I raise my hands. Hold up. Okay. I take a deep breath. There is so much here. Can we please switch back to English? Because I'm pretty sure I'm misinterpreting everything. First of all, he knows all my flaws. What the f what gives, Ma? How does he know any of this stuff about me? She met him online. Fourth aunt cries, triumphantly. I guess she's been bursting with the secret this whole time, because her entire face is shining with excitement. Your mother went online, to a dating site, and has been chatting with him for weeks. What? Oh my god so it's not a loss in translation. She really did go and find me a random guy to go out on a date with. Ma, is this for real? Yes, very good idea, right? This way, you and him get to know each other before the date, which is tonight. Tonight? I squawk. But I don't know him. I know nothing about him, aside that he's been chatting with my mother for weeks. I mean, Good grief, that is some messed up shit, Ma. That why I tell you now, Ma says, completely unfazed. 
Meanwhile, my cheeks are so hot they're practically melting off my face. Oh, he is such a good boy, so respectful of his elders. How would you know? I realize how loud my voice is when heads at the next table swivel round. To be loud enough to attract attention in a dim sum restaurant during the lunch rush is damn near impossible, which just goes to show how fucking pissed I am. He by his parents' house. A mansion in San Marino, very good location. My three aunties nod solemnly. San Marino is basically my family's holy grail close enough to SGV for those late-night Taiwanese bubble teas, far enough to be surrounded by non-immigrants. Ma and her sisters have had their eye on San Marino ever since they immigrated here. And he loves cooking, Ma says, with a pointed glare at me, very good because no matter how many times I teach you, you still don't know how. How can you be good wife, you can't even cook rice. Stay on the topic, fourth aunt says. For once, Ma listens to her. He has two dogs. You always want dog. Now you can have two. They are so well groomed. Look. She brandishes a photo of two glossy golden retrievers that are so golden and so perfectly shaped they look like they could be some pet magazine models. I tell him, I say, I'm wedding photographer, and he say, wow, so impressive, and I say. Wait. I have to take a second to let the words sink in. Did you just ma? Did you go on a dating site as me? I sit there with my mouth open, not breathing or blinking or anything. Of course she did. Second aunt says. How else can she meet the boy? If she say her real age, 56. 53, Ma interjects. Fourth aunt snorts. If she say her real age, then she will matching with men her age, second aunt explains very slowly, nodding and smiling at me encouragingly. You see? Is why she has to pretend she is you. I can't even right now. What is my life? While my mind sputters to catch up with the situation, Ma regales me with more of the deep, soulful messages that Jake the hotel owner has sent me. He's seen my pictures and apparently finds me breathtaking. Do you have any photos of him, at least? I ask him, but I think maybe he a bit shy, Ma says. You realize that means he's a complete troll? Fourth aunt says. Ma waves her off. I think it's because he's so handsome, he don't want show off photo, he wants to make sure you falling in love with him, not his face. Also, he's Taiwanese, so his Mandarin very good, second aunt says. Maybe you can improve your Mandarin with him. Whenever you speak Mandarin, adieu, give me headache. Sorry, I mumble. I'm so flustered by everything they're throwing at me that I don't know how to react. I need to can I see these chat messages? Adieu, no time for that, Ma says. You trust me, okay, this one is very good boy. Very good. If you don't go, you miss out. And, to my horror, despite the awfulness of everything, part of me is being won over, which clearly means I have lost my damn mind. But the last time I went on a date was Last summer? Last fall? Christ on a cracker. Has it really been that long? And don't even get me started on the last time I got laid. As my best friend Selena likes to remind me, Del, you need to get some before that thing closes up shop for good. I look down at my lap, at that thing. Why can't Selena just say vagina? You're not gonna close up shop for good, are you? Okay, I have just started talking to my vagina. Maybe Ma's right. I desperately need to go out on a date. And so what if it's been set up in the weirdest, most awkward way ever? Must go, why eh, Ma is saying, unaware that I've quietly talked myself and my vagina into agreeing. Must not cancel, Big Aunt says. If you cancel last minute it's so offensive, you know. So offensive, second aunt says. But we know you not do that. You are nice girl. 
You'll jeopardize the wedding weekend, fourth aunt says. You must go, be your lovely, sweet self. He'll fall in love for sure. I stare at my mother and my aunts. They stare back at me, smiling and nodding in that way cats do when they've cornered a mouse. Fine. I sigh. Tell me everything I'm supposed to know about my date tonight. 2. Sophomore year, seven years ago. You are not putting cut up hot dog and kim kai in yours, I say, wrinkling my nose. Oh right, you can put that panda thing in yours, but I can't put hot dog and kim kai in mine. Nathan says, stirring his bizarre mug cake batter. Pandan is a legit cake flavor, you cave person. What kind of mug cake has hot dog and kim kai? The best kind, Nathan says easily. You know mine's gonna come out tasting way better than yours, and then you're just going to end up eating it all. Not. Possible. Ten minutes later, I give a cry of frustration when my spoon hits the bottom of his mug. Is that all there is? Nathan laughs. Told you. Although I have to admit, panda is delicious. It's pandan. We're not eating the animal. It's a plant. Oh. This whole time I thought we were eating, like, a secretion from panda's glands or something. Now it's my turn to laugh. Seriously, this guy. You are such a dork. Oh my god, I can't believe which gland. Obviously anal. Gross. He gives that grin the one that makes his eyes almost fully close. The one that makes me want to throw up. Just to be clear, it makes me want to throw up because it's so cute it does weird things to my stomach, not because it disgusts me. When I told Selena about the nauseating grin, she said, well, you either have stomach flu or you're in love. Either way, stay away from me. I can't afford to get sick. In love. I watch as Nathan gets up and heads to the fridge to make another hot dog and kim kai mug cake for me, and I know, of course I know, that I'm stupidly, annoyingly check my phone every half minute in love with him. Ever since we got to know each other during Freshers Week, Nathan and I have become fast friends. It feels meant to be. We've even got the same last name, Chan. What are the chances of that? Okay, so it's the most common surname in Hong Kong which is where his dad's from, and one of the most popular surnames in China, which is where my granddad's from, but it feels like fate. We hang out almost every day and do lots of random stuff. We've located the best spots to nap in the library, we've found the best ice cream sandwich combo at Diddy Reese, white chocolate macadamia nut cookie with butter pecan, and today, he came over to my dorm's common room to make mug cakes. It's like my friendship with Selena except with stomach-turning attraction on my part. On his part. Well, I don't know. Sometimes I think he's attracted to me too. Sometimes I catch him watching me with his eyes all soft, which makes my stomach lurch, thank you, stomach. But then he'll do stuff like rest his elbow on the top of my head when we're waiting for the red light to change, and then I'm pretty sure he sees me as just a friend. Which I'm totally cool with. I'm down for platonic friendship, yeah. I'm chill. Totes chillax. Nathan places a hand on my shoulder and I practically leap out of the chair. Whoa, you okay? I snort. Duh, of course, why wouldn't I be? It's not as if I was interrupted midday dream about his abs, which I swear are visible through his ukla hoodie. Did you hear what I said? What? About the party at Phi Kappa? A grimace takes over my face. A frat party? What about it? Um, do you wanna go? My friend's a member, and he says their parties are great. I don't know, could be fun. You do realize a frat party is where every bad thing happens. Alcohol poisoning, date rape, hazing. Okay, okay. Nathan laughs. I get it, you don't have to go. Ugh, why do I have to be such a killjoy? I do want to go. 
I just I don't know. I guess I'm deathly afraid that Nathan might realize I'm into him, and that would be massively embarrassing. Thankfully, the microwave dings then. Nathan busies himself with taking out the mug cake. He moves so effortlessly around the shared kitchen, always with this liquid grace that reminds me of some feline creature. Like a lion, or a lynx. He sprinkles freshly cut chives over the mug cake and slides it over to me. I thank him even though I've lost my appetite. Anyway, I gotta go. I promised Matt I'd hit the gym with him. Thanks for the cake, I say in the world's most casual voice. Have a good workout, I call out at the last minute, and then immediately regret it. That sounded like nagging. He flashes me that grin again, and is gone. I slump back to my room. Selena barely looks up from her calculus textbook when I flop dramatically onto my bed. Blue balls, she says, scribbling in her notebook. The bluest balls, I groan into my pillow. Pretty sure the book's called The Bluest Eye. I turn my head and glare at her. You're not very empathetic. Did he ask you to go to the Phi Kappa party? How did you know about that? Selena rolls her eyes. Because I have a social life. And Nathan was very casually asking if you were going. I groan. I am the worst at parties. If he ever saw me at one, he'd realize I am the most unamazing person in the world. That's why you haven't gone to any parties here. Selena gawks at me. Boy, you have issues. Okay. It's settled. You're going to this one. No. Yes. No, you can't make me, I won't. I won't. Friday night, Selena and I stand outside Phi Kappa, a house that's quite literally vibrating with music. I mean, I can actually see the windows rattling with each deep bass beat. This is a bad idea, I moan. The only parties I like are the sit around playing board games kind. Focus, Selena says, grabbing me by the shoulders. You look hot as shit, and we're gonna go in there and you're gonna find Nathan, and I'm gonna find some hot girl or guy, whichever comes first, and we're both gonna score tonight. Score? I squeak. You know, smash? I narrow my eyes at her. Bone? Coitus? Do I really have to say sexual intercourse? My voice comes out several octaves higher than most human voices usually go. I wasn't going to I'm not ready to. Selena cackles. Oh god, your face. I'm just kidding. No fucking tonight, okay? You and Nathan are too adorable to fall for the drunk one-night stand bullshit. We'll just find him, he'll take one look at you in this outfit, and that'll be that. He's going to die. Not literally, I hope, I mutter under my breath, just in case the curse is listening in. I take a deep breath and follow Selena as she struts confidently into the heaving frat house. It's even worse inside than I thought it would be. The music is so loud my teeth rattle to the beat. Selena dives into the crowd, slithering between the hot, pulsing bodies, pulling me along with her. I have no idea where we're headed or how she even knows where to go. Someone spills an icy drink down the tight jeans Selena's lent me for the night and I squeal, letting go of Selena's hand, but any sound I make is immediately swallowed by the din. The bodies heave and close behind Selena. I cry out her name, but even I can't hear my own voice. And now I'm alone. I take a deep breath, which is a mistake. Frat houses probably don't smell great at the best of times, and an hour into a roaring party, it smells radioactive. I gag, steal myself, and plunge back into the crowd, calling out for Selena. Some drunk guy stumbles and crashes into me, his sudden momentum making me stumble. I'm about to be trampled. This is not a good way to die. Whoa, hey, someone says, pulling me off the sticky floor. Nathan, I breathe. He blinks. Medi? 
Then he seems to actually see me for the first time, and his eyes widen. Wow. I gnaw on my lip. Selena would be so proud of his reaction, but I feel stupid, as if I'm wearing someone else's clothes. Which I am. Selena stuffed me into a pair of jeans so tight I'm pretty sure they're going to have to be cut off my legs, and a shimmery, backless tank top that doesn't allow for a bra. She says it's fine since bras are really only for women with boobs. Harsh but true. Oh, hey, I say, as if I totally was not expecting to see him here, as if I didn't expressly come here half-naked just to surprise him into loving me back. What, he shouts. I said hey. I shout back. Hey yourself, he shouts. At least, I think that's what he shouts. What? I shout. We both shake our heads and laugh, and whatever awkwardness there was between us melts away like a little piece of marshmallow. He takes my hand and squeezes it before leading me across the room. My heart squeezes painfully arg, he's going to notice how sweaty my palms are and then he'll let go and I'll lose him in the crowd the same way I lost Selena but Nathan keeps a tight grip on my fingers and weaves through the crowd slowly, turning back every few steps to make sure I'm okay. And then suddenly, we're out in the backyard, chilly night wind stinging my face and my bare back, making me break out in goosebumps. Nathan closes the glass door behind us, and the thumping music is cut off, thank God. You made it, Nathan says, giving me a one-armed hug. Where's Selena? Somewhere inside. I check my phone and send her a quick message letting her know I'm in the backyard. While I'm on my phone, Nathan greets the other people out here. There's a handful of them, all of them carrying red plastic cups or bottles of IPA. Okay, I can do this. It's way more relaxed out here. I shove my hands in my pockets, or try to, anyway. It turns out these stupid jeans are way too tight to fit even a pinky in. Nathan introduces me to his friends, whose names I immediately forget, but when I tell them mine, a couple of them light up and glance at Nathan, who narrows his eyes back at them. My heart clatters against my ribcage. Does that mean he's told his friends about me? Does that mean he loves me in a more than just friends way? Okay, slow down, bunny boiler. It doesn't mean anything. A girl hands me a bottle of IPA and holds out a bottle opener to me. Just hang it on that hook when you're done. She points at a hook that's been nailed onto a tree in the middle of the yard. I do as she told me, and when I turn around from the tree, I walk right into Nathan's chest. OOF. You okay? Sorry. I thought you knew I was right behind you. I rub my nose. Geez, are you wearing a breastplate under your shirt? He flexes his biceps dramatically. What can I say? I'm just really cut. More like bony. He isn't, though. Not by a long shot. I tear my horny eyes away from his pecs. What is it about guys' pecs that I find so attractive? It's like I'm a boob man, but the reverse. A peck girl. Then my gaze lands on Nathan's hands, and I think, um, he has nice hands. Maybe I'm a hand girl. Or maybe I'm just a Nathan everything girl. I lean back against the tree trunk in an effort to look, well, effortless, but that turns out to be a massive mistake. Pro tip, don't lean against a tree trunk when wearing a backless top. Shit, I hiss rubbing at my back. What's on this stupid tree, razor blades? Um, that would be tree bark. Let me see your back. And before I know it, Nathan's fingers are on my bare skin. A warm, strong hand against my chilled back. My muscles melt into water. My stomach is basically a puddle. I swallow, reminding myself to breathe. Just a scratch. You'll live but his hand doesn't leave my back. Instead, his fingers splay across it, making my entire body tingle. You cold? I can barely speak as he takes off his jacket and drapes it over my shoulders. This is it. 
This is when I tell him that I've been having sex dreams about him no, that I have a massive crush on him, that I think he's as perfect as humans come. His jacket's so big it hangs off my shoulders. Has anyone ever told you how ridiculously tiny you are? Excuse you, I am five feet two. On a good day, in heels, Nathan murmurs, giving me that dimpled smile. He pulls the jacket closed around me and gives a little tug, as if he doesn't want to let go. I don't want him to let go. Hey, he says, his voice soft velvet. I look up and fall into his gaze. Hey. For once, there are no jokes, no smart-ass remarks, no thick layer of friendship between us. It's just him, and me, and the chilly desert night, and string lights glowing like stars around us. I'm glad you came, Nathan says. And for once, I'm 100% honest with him. I came to see you. That smile again, and then he dips his head, stooping low as I raise mine, and our lips meet in a soft crush that obliterates whatever other thoughts I had. Okay. 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 I've kissed boys before. Okay, two boys. Okay, one of them was the back of my hand. The kiss with the other boy wasn't great, I mean, my hand was better, honestly. I've never liked the look of those Hollywood open-mouthed kisses, I eat way too much fermented shrimp paste to have any qualms about me being a great kisser. When it comes to kissing, it's closed mouth all the way for me. But, this. Holy shit. Nathan is the perfect counter to my prudish mouth. His lips are soft, and his breath is a heady mix of rum and mint, and he doesn't just slip his tongue in like Christian Miller did in ninth grade. Nathan takes his time, touching his lips to mine so gently, so feathery soft, until I'm a boneless, watery mass. I wrap my arms around his broad, strong shoulders for support, and he half lifts me off my feet. And then before I know it, my mouth parts, and I'm really kissing Nathan Chan, and it is hot as hell. In this moment, I know this is it. There is no one like Nathan, not the way he's holding me, so firmly, the length of my body pressed up against his. And the moment I realize it, I know I'm pretty much screwed. 3. Present Day Medi, 7.03 p.m., this is such a bad idea. How in the hell did I let them talk me into doing this? Selena, 7.04 p.m., by being yourself. Medi, 7.04 p.m. Medi, 7.05, it's all your fault. If you'd been at dim sum, you would have run interference and I wouldn't be sitting here waiting for some dude my mom's been catfishing. Selena, 7.06 p.m., right, like I would have dared stop your fam's plans of setting you up. Plus, this is fun. Medi, 7.08 p.m., you are the worst. Know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna tell them this date went so well that they should do the same for you. Selena, 7.09 p.m., if your mom can find me a rich hotel owner to date, I'm down. What's the problem? I sigh and lower the phone to the table. If I told her the truth, that I'm still hung up on Nathan, she'd tell me to stop being so pathetic. Hello, Medellin. A warm, low voice says. I startle, shaking all thoughts of Nathan out of my mind. Do not start off this date being haunted by Nathan's ghost. I look up, and okay, Ma, you did well. Fourth aunt was wrong. Jake is definitely not a troll. He's not as devastatingly gorgeous as Nathan are, stop it, self but he's definitely good looking. He'd fit into a K-pop band for sure. Tall, lithe, flawless skin, and a slightly impish smile that I find impossible not to return. Fourth aunt would be all over him. I stand to give the handsome man before me oh god, hug or handshake. He reaches out and pulls me into a hug, solving my minor crisis and hiding my social ineptitude, his hand lingering on my lower back. By the time we break apart, I'm blushing a little. That wasn't a normal nice to meet you hug. Or was it? Have I been out of the game that long? 
Jake must have sensed my slight unease, because he gives me a sheepish grin and says, sorry if that was too much. I'm just so excited to finally meet you in person. Of course. For him, we are not complete strangers. We've been chatting for weeks. The poor sucker. I can't believe my mom catfished someone into dating me. Okay, focus. I manage a smile. Um, me too. You are even more beautiful in person, he says, and reaches across the table to take my hands. Ah. My smile freezes into a Chrissy Teigen-esque grimace smile, but he doesn't seem to notice. He flags down a waiter and says, bring us a bottle of your best champagne. Is there a polite way of pulling my hands back? My mind is short-circuiting, trying to work its way through the mess. Okay, so obviously things have gotten deep for this guy. Deeper than Ma led me to believe. Damn it, why didn't I try harder to see the chat messages? If I pulled my hands away, would he feel hurt? Betrayed? Oh god, even worse, what if he realizes it wasn't me he's been talking to but my mother? He'll lose his shit for sure, and then would he try to get us fired? Badmouth us to the bride and groom at the very least. Jesus, what if he sees us? Is that even possible? You okay, he says. I blink and refocus on him. I take a deep breath. Sorry, yeah, I'm fine. Something on your mind? You suing me and my family for fraud? Um, nothing. Just. Work, I guess? He nods. Like I've told you before, your work is amazing. Heat rises up my neck. I almost blurt out, you've seen my work. But managed to stop myself in time. Of course he's seen my work. It would have been one of the first things Ma revealed to him. Our website, with thousands of pictures of happy couples, is pretty awesome, if I do say so myself. You capture all those emotions so well, he continues. Honestly, sometimes I'm like, damn, Jake, how did you get this lucky? I laugh weakly. He is in deep, the poor guy. I'll be nice. I've got to give this a good go, if only for his sake. I almost stupidly say, and what is it you do, when I recall that I do actually know what he does? You're too kind. So tell me, how did you get into the hotel business? Jake shrugs. I was working in finance right out of college. Worked on Wall Street for a while, and then I thought, well, I've made a fortune a couple of fortunes, really. He laughs. I don't really see what's funny, but I laugh along anyway, then feel like a complete idiot. I toyed around with a few ideas and then decided I wanted to build a resort where my family and friends could visit and have fun. Why not, right? It's a perk of being filthy rich. I'm spared having to answer when the waiter returns with our champagne. It's hard to imagine how this guy managed to charm my mom into oh, who am I kidding? At 26, I'm as good as a spinster. Ma would have dished me out to any guy as long as he has a pulse. I'm so nervous by now that I take a gulp of champagne before Jake says, cheers. Right, sorry. Cheers. I clink my glass against his and down it. If I'm going to get through tonight, I'm going to need a lot of champagne. Maybe it's the champagne, or maybe it's the fact that the food at the restaurant is excellent, whatever it is, halfway through dinner I realize that I'm actually having an okay time. Jake has a way of dropping little obnoxious hints about how rich he is so rich that when I sweat, I drip diamonds but aside from that, he's actually got a good sense of humor, and he does seem to be genuinely interested in me, which is a pleasant surprise. What I do doesn't normally interest men, in fact, most men seem to think that just because I'm in the wedding industry, that must mean I'm in a rush to get married myself. The truth is, being in the wedding industry is a surefire way of making me not want to get married. I tell Jake as much, and he laughs. Maybe it's just that you haven't met the right guy, he says. My heart gives a squeeze, 
and my smile wanes. It's not that I haven't met the right guy, I want to tell him. It's that I've met him, and I know that no one else compares. But I have just enough sense not to blurt that out. Plus, it's been four years since Nathan and I split up, and I seriously need to forget him. Pretty sure being hung up on an ex for four years counts as, if not pathetic, then at least bordering on creepy. You must meet so many bridezillas, Jake says. Actually, the brides have largely been okay, save for one or two exceptions. Surprisingly, it's been the grooms who have been trickier to handle. Really? I find that hard to believe. Don't you often get brides asking you to photoshop them to look thinner, or whatever? I shrug, taking another swallow of champagne. Sure, sometimes. But thinning down's easy. Know what's really tricky? When grooms ask me to make them taller. I can make them look more swole, but height is a real pain to edit. Oh, I'm straying too close to ranting about my favorite subject, groomzillas. There are just so many of them, but for some reason, brides get all the bad representative what about you. You must deal with difficult customers a lot of the time. Nah, I've got people to deal with them for me. That's why we've got a whole customer service team, you know? He laughs again. It's starting to grate on me. I drink more champagne. By the time we're done with the meal, I'm tipsy enough to know that I probably shouldn't drive home. I'm gonna call a lift, I tell him, taking my phone out and noticing, with some dismay, that the battery is at 4%. What? No. Let me drive you. Give me your keys. That's okay, really. I'll take a lift and then come back for my car in the morning. The parking structure opens at 8am didn't you say you need to be at the harbour by 8.30 tomorrow? You won't make it in time. I curse under my breath. He's right. I need my car early tomorrow morning. Damn it, self. Why do you have to go and get all tipsy? But what about you? Don't you need your car in the morning? I don't want everything to come screeching to a halt because I've made you late. I have other cars I can drive, and the hotel should be running smoothly enough by now not to fall apart just because I'm a couple of hours late. In fact, you probably won't see much of me tomorrow. I'll be mostly working behind the scenes, he answers easily, holding out his hand. I can't see a way out of this. If I keep refusing his offer, he's bound to get offended, and then there goes our big wedding weekend. I mean, one would hope that he's professional enough not to let a bad date get in the way of business, but can I really risk my family's biggest wedding of the year? And anyway, it's just a drive home. It's really not a big deal. I live with Ma, so if he tries to weasel his way inside, I can always use her as an excuse. As I fumble for my car keys, my hand brushes against the heavy taser that I carry everywhere. I really should stop taking it everywhere I go, it's heavy, it's cumbersome, and it probably makes me seem like a paranoid idiot. Still, as I hand over the keys to my Subaru, I can't help feeling glad that I have that taser. And then, of course, I feel silly for feeling relieved. Jake puts his hand on my lower back as we walk across the parking lot, which seems awfully forward, but again, I don't feel comfortable enough to tell him to stop. When we get inside the car and close the doors, the silence is suddenly all I can think about. I can hear every noise we make each inhale and exhale and even my own heartbeat. Then Jake turns on the engine and Maroon 5 spills out of the speakers. I relax a little. He gives me a reassuring smile as he adjusts the mirrors. I smile back. This is okay. I'll be home before I know it, and tomorrow when we see each other, we'll be friendly and pleasant and totally professional. Everything's for you. So that was fun, huh, he says, as he drives out of the parking lot into the darkened street. It's late, and though we're on the main road, there are hardly any cars about. He glances at me, and I nod. Yeah, super fun. 
Super fun. What am I, 15? I had a good time, I add. That's stretching it a little, but I guess I didn't have a bad time, so. Me too. You're a great gal, Medi. He gives me a wink, and then oh dear god he reaches over and rests his hand on my knee. I shift, pulling away, but his hand remains there, its heat radiating up my thigh. Come on, dude, that's the universal sign for take your goddamn hand off my leg. Okay, I can't. I cannot with this. Not even for the family business. Sorry, ma and aunties. Heart racing, I gently push his hand off my leg, as if it's a hamster I need to handle with care. He glances at me and grins. So you wanna play it like that, huh? A sick feeling bubbles up in my stomach. Um. Think fast, Medi. I think I'm feeling okay now. You can just stop right here and I'll drive the rest of the way back myself. He pouts at me. And leave me stranded in the middle of nowhere? Um. I'll call you a lift, wait here with you until it arrives. I really don't want to trouble you, and tomorrow's going to be such a long day for the both of us. He laughs. God, you're sweet. The way he says it doesn't sound at all like a compliment. It sounds dirty, as if he's talking about an overripe peach he can't wait to sink his teeth into. He turns down a side street, and it's as if we've left the city of LA behind. Everything is dark down here, even the trees look menacing, and there's not a single car or person in sight. Stop the car, I say, my voice coming out tight with fear. Stop right now. Instead, he speeds up. I scramble for the door, but it's locked, and even in my panic, I know we're going way too fast for me to take the jump. At best, I'd break an arm. At worst, I'd die. Oh God. The sickening realization hits me. I might actually die tonight. Bile rushes up my esophagus. I can't tell how long I sit there, frozen, while we speed even farther away from civilization. I no longer recognize my surroundings. Outside, there are only what look like abandoned factories. There is no one to save me. Calm down, meds. Hey, come on, we're just having fun, right? He glances at me and actually smiles. Don't be such a tease, I know you're not shy. Those texts you sent me, I know you're a dirty girl deep down inside. So I'll tell you how this goes. We're gonna find a nice spot, and get real cozy. The taser darts shoot out and hit him right in the neck. Jake jacks like a doll. The car swerves to the side. I open my mouth to scream. Darkness. 4. Junior year, six years ago. This is unreal, I breathe out as I gaze out the airplane window. Yeah. I look down at my hand, nestled in Nathan's. It looks so tiny in his paw. He gives it a squeeze, and we smile at each other. Holy shit, I'm actually doing this. In about ten hours, we'll be landing at London Heathrow Airport, where we'll be greeted by his parents. Oh my god. I cannot. Stop freaking out. I'm not. Okay, tell your face to stop freaking out. I force a smile, which comes out as a grimace. That is officially the weirdest smile in the history of smiles, he says, leaning over to kiss me. Um, I love it when I kiss your teeth. That gets a laugh out of me, which makes me feel a tiny bit better. But not much. Because holy shitballs, man. I'm on a plane with Nathan. On the way to meet his family. For Christmas. In England. What is this life? Hey, how come you don't have an English accent? I never thought of it, but now that we're actually on our way to London, it strikes me that Nathan sounds about as American as it gets. It's because my parents moved around a lot when I was little, 
so I was always put into international schools. Even in England, they put me in an international school. Easier to transfer my grades that way. Do you want me to sound English? I can talk British for you, love. Oh God. Okay, you can't carry it off. I shudder, and he laughs. By the way, I got Selena those AirPods she's been lusting after for Christmas. Signed it from you and me. I gape at him. Really? That's so generous. I'd given her an assortment of moisturizers from Bath and Body Works. Well, yeah, none of this would have been possible without her help. True. Over the last two years, Selena has come home with me on many weekends. She's a hit with my family, my aunts tell her she's the daughter they wish they had, which hello, what about me? But whatever, and Ma tells her she's the sister she wished I had, which I have to agree with. And when Nathan invited me to his home for Christmas, Selena gave me the best gift anyone could come up with. She told Ma she wanted me to come back with her to Northern California for Christmas, and Ma had agreed without hesitation, since my family doesn't celebrate Christmas anyway. Nathan takes out his tablet from his backpack and sets it up on our tray table. I downloaded Immortals for the flight. Ooh, you are a godsend, Nathan Chan. I figured shots of a topless Henry Cavill would help take your mind off meeting my folks. I roll my eyes. There is way too much boobage in Immortals for you to act all selfless. True. He laughs, then leans in and lowers his voice. But yours are my favorite. I smack his arm, but honestly, I'm sort of grinning at that. He pulls me closer so I can rest my head on his shoulder and we settle down to watch the movie. At some point, we both fall asleep. When the air attendant wakes us up hours later, I find to my immense horror that my head is stuck at a weird angle. Oh, no. No, no. I try to turn it, but pain shoots down my spine, and I squeak. Nathan stretches, yawning. What's up, fun size? I fell asleep badly, and now my neck's refusing to turn. He stares at me for two beats before bursting out laughing. Are you secretly a 90-year-old woman? Don't insult me, kid. I'm only 87. Ah. I can't meet your parents like this. I gesture wildly at my slanted head. Calm down. Come here. Nathan places a hand on the back of my neck and begins to massage it. Ow. Ooh, ah. Oh. Is it painful or is it good as hell? I can't decide. Stop twitching. Please put on your seat belts and face forward, and our attendant reminds us with a pointed look. We do as we're told. Despite Nathan's best efforts, my head's still stuck at an angle. Whenever this happens, I usually have to wait until I can sleep it off before I regain normal flexibility in my neck. So. I really am going to meet his parents with a slanted head. Okay, that's totally fine. I am not at all freaking out about that. Once we get off the plane, Nathan tries again to massage some movement back into my neck and shoulders, then he says, well, this'll be fun. He laughs when I hit him, catching my fist and kissing it. It's so cute when you hit me with your teeny weeny hand. It'll be okay. They are going to love you so much they won't let you go back to the States. And, despite the crooked neck, he's right. As soon as we get our bags and go into the arrivals hall, there's a shout and suddenly his parents are right there. His mom, a beautiful tall blonde, gives me a quick hug, and his dad, an Asian man who looks like what I imagine Nathan will look like 30 years down the road, gives me one of those awkward hugs that my mom and aunts often do. Oh, it's lovely to have you two here, his mom says. Hi, Mrs. Chan. She poo-poos at me. Call me Annie, none of that Mrs. Chen business. And that's Chris. She points at Nathan's dad, who smiles at me. All right then, son. 
Chris says. All right, Dad. Ha! Huh. Nathan does speak British after all. When we walk outside, I gasp at the sharp, unforgiving cold, which slices right through my hoodie. Nathan takes out a jacket he's brought for me, which is about three sizes too big but is delightfully warm and smells of him. The drive from Heathrow to Oxford takes almost two hours, and by the time we get off the freeway or motorway, as it's called here I'm exhausted. Though Chris and Annie are perfectly pleasant, they're so different from Ma and my aunts that I'm constantly on edge, desperate to make the best impression possible. Conversation with them is somewhat stilted, and I wonder if this is what all English families are like, if they all use words like lovely and delightful instead of shouting and flapping like my family does. It only cements the decision I've made about keeping Nathan from my family for as long as humanly possible which is getting tougher and tougher to pull off. Nathan wants to meet Ma. And all my aunties. It's a bit of a sore spot in our otherwise perfect relationship. I'm so worried that he thinks I haven't introduced him to my family because I'm ashamed of him. Why don't I take him home with me one weekend? He'd ask. They'd be delighted, they would. And they would, if they knew about him. But. It's not even just the stark differences in our families that's holding me back from taking him home. My whole life, I've followed all of Ma's rules. I even chose to stay in LA for her. I love Ma, but I also want to be separate from her. Even thinking it makes me wince, it feels so much like a betrayal. But I do. I'm a horrible, selfish person, and I know I need to keep that part of me buried. I know that after college, I'll have to go back home, be with Ma. And for now, I just want Nathan all to myself. I want to keep him as separate as I can from Ma and my aunts. If that's selfish, then let me be selfish, just for now, just until we graduate. I don't want him to be swallowed up by my loud, overbearing family. I don't want him to see me the way I am with them quiet and benign. I want him to see the real me the one on campus, where I can really be myself free and sarcastic and sharp. A challenge instead of a shadow. Then, of course, there's the curse. What if taking him home means it finds me even sooner than it had found my mom and aunts? I've tried explaining my reasoning for keeping him away from my family, but each time I just end up verbally flailing, and then the conversation ends with him hurt and disappointed. His parents' house is worthy of an interior design magazine. In fact, it has been featured in Home and Garden magazine, Nathan tells me when my mouth drops open once we walk inside. Nathan takes me up to his bedroom, and I gape at how tidy and tasteful everything is. It has a navy blue color scheme, and I can imagine what a neat kitty must have been because everything is in its place. I think back to my own room back in San Gabriel and how, just last weekend, I'd found a forgotten coffee mug that had actual mushrooms growing in it. Not even mold but like full-grown mushrooms, with stalks and heads and everything. So this is my childhood home, and that's my family, Nathan says, dropping our bags on the carpeted floor. You okay? I'm sorry, I know they can be a bit much. Are you kidding? They are amazing. And your house is amazing. Not at all like mine, I want to say, but I don't, because honestly, I'm embarrassed. Ma and my aunts are practically hoarders. They say it has to do with growing up poor. The bathroom, for example, has no fewer than 27 bottles of face cream. I know, I counted them when I was 15, and the pile hasn't moved in the last five years. They are all almost empty. When I asked Ma why she doesn't throw them away, she says, maybe one day I need, then how? I guess a grower of mushrooms in coffee cups is not one to judge. Nathan wraps his hands around my waist, his fingers brushing underneath my shirt. I shiver when he touches my skin. Hey, none of that, not right now. Your parents are right below us, I scold, smacking his arm. He grins and kisses me. 
I'm not doing anything, he says, in between kisses. I just love touching you here. His hands splay across my back, and I melt against him. You've got your horny face on, I say. What does my horny face look like? I lean back and try to imitate it, and Nathan bursts out laughing. Seriously. If my horny face looks like that, why did you ever start sleeping with me? Out of pity. Then I squeal as he catches me and flings me over one shoulder as though I'm a sack of potatoes. Don't make me fart while my butt's right next to your face. I dare you to. Nathan laughs, but then he lowers me gently onto his bed and kisses me again, this time slow and deep. By the time he stops, I'm out of breath and aching for him. He presses his forehead against mine. I'm so glad you're here. Me too. I bite my lip against my smile, then gasp as he starts sucking lightly at my neck. Maybe it's because we were friends before we started seeing each other. Whatever it is, Nathan seems to know exactly what I want and how I want it. Every touch is addicting, the smell of him intoxicating. It's weird, finding out that we're not just compatible as friends. Shirts are flung off, jeans tugged down, and soon we're in our underwear, and the touch of his skin against mine is so good my entire body is blushing. We've done this probably close to a hundred times by now, but still, when Nathan takes off my bra, he does so with reverence, his breath coming out slow and sweet as my breasts are laid bare before him. As always, I have to fight the instinct to cover them, but Nathan is so gentle, bending down to kiss my jawline, my neck, my chest, before his mouth finds my nipple and I am lost. I forget everything the curse, my ma and aunts, even my own name. I bury my fingers in his hair and there's just me and Nathan. Everything Nathan. Nathan's mouth, Nathan's fingers, Nathan's body. The first time was a bit awkward and lasted all of four minutes. But by now we've found a rhythm that drives all thought from my head and turns me into a being of need. And when our eyes meet, neither of us looks away until the very last gasp. Later, lying in bed next to him, I realize something. We've been together for almost two years now, and he's the first one I tell everything to when I get my papers back, when we're assigned terrible coursework, when the leader of the photography club says anything dumb, which is all the time. And he does the same, telling me every interesting detail about his Ekin classes, sharing his wildest dreams of owning a fancy hotel in the future, even telling me how much weight he's doing at the gym. I guess the last one's him showing off, but I don't mind. I like that Nathan wants to impress me, because I want to impress him too. And he does impress me. Even after two years, which involves a lot of farting and embarrassing bedroom stuff, queefs, anyone, I still find Nathan impressive as hell. I love him. I want a life with him. To hell with the family curse. It doesn't matter. I'm in Oxford, England. This is where curses go to die. I almost laugh out loud at the thought. I haven't really stopped to think about how much half believing in the curse has weighed me down, but now I realize that I've always felt it lurking behind my back, felt it giving me an expiration date. But it's stupid. Why damn the relationship when there's nothing wrong with it? I make a choice. When I get home, I'm going to tell Ma about Nathan. I'll tell her everything. I'll even tell my aunts. I'll tell them all over Sunday dim sum, since they're always happy when they're eating dim sum. That'll go over well. 5. Present day. Fuck. Pain. So much of it, it lurches from deep in my bones, squeezing my chest with a red fist, and then it erupts out of me in a moan, and the sound of my voice so hoarse with pain it's alien, brings me back. I blink. Blink again. Right. I'm in my car. Not in England with Nathan. My car. Light flashes at the edge of my vision. It's my turn signal, 
which is making an infernal clicking noise. I reach out to turn it off, and the movement makes pain burst through my chest. Jesus. With one last heroic try, I manage to hit the turn signal switch. Sweet, blessed silence. I glance down, not daring to turn my head too much. My seat belts digging into my chest. With a swallow, I push myself back slightly, still unsure what's broken and what isn't. Moving back makes the crushing sensation around my chest ease a little. I take a small breath, then another, a bigger one. It hurts, but not too much. Ribs bruised, not broken. I release a shuddering laugh. Unbelievable. I'm okay. I'm. I turn and barely stifle the shriek clawing its way up my throat. Jake. Oh God. God, I moan. Jake my voice catches. Every question that pops into my head seems so stupid, so unnecessary. Are you okay? It's obvious he's not, not when he's lying against the dashboard like that. Are you dead? I moan again. Oh my god. I think he is. There's blood trickling out of his goddamn ear, down his neck, staining the collar of his shirt. Somehow, it's that small detail, the growing stain of blood on his white polo, that really hits home. He's dead. I killed him. My panicked, gulping breaths fill the silent car. I look around wildly. Help, I whisper. But there's no one in sight. The street is deserted. I don't even know where we are. I hit my seat belt lock, wrench the door open, and lurch out of the car, barely making it out onto the pavement before my dinner comes back out. There's a dead man in my car. A man. Dead. In the driver's seat of my Subaru. This is not at all on brand for Subaru. Subarus aren't killers' cars. Jeep Wranglers are. Or, um, whoever makes those windowless white vans. Who makes those, anyway? I mean, those are creepy AF. Focus. A sob warbles out. No. I can't afford to freak out right now. If I start crying, I'm never going to stop. What do I do? Cops. Yeah. 9-11, right. I open the back seat and reach inside, shielding my gaze from Jake's body, focus on finding my purse there it is. Cell phone. Nothing happens when I hit the power button. I moan. No, please. Out of power. I inhale shakily and reach for Jake's pocket. Maybe his phone's in there. My teeth grit so hard when the tips of my fingers brush against his pants that I almost crack my molars. Empty. The thought of groping about his pants for his phone is nauseating. Okay. This is fine. This is totally and utterly okay. I'll just. I'll wait here until a car drives by. Except. Except God knows how long we've been here, and no one's driven past. There are no houses or convenience stores or anything that might contain human life around me. The factories look like they haven't been used in years, many of the windows are broken and they're completely silent. I can't wait here much longer. I can't stand it. I glance back at the car. Incredibly, despite having crashed into a tree, it looks largely okay. The hood's dented, obviously, and there's a large crack running up one side of the windshield, but aside from that, it looks drivable. No, I mutter to myself. I can't possibly drive it. Not least because there is a dead guy in the driver's seat. Then move him. My whole body recoils at the thought of touching him again. But my mind is like a caged wild animal, throwing itself against the bars and hissing. I need to get out of here. I can't stay here another minute, 
hoping for someone to drive by, hoping they'd be nice enough to stop. Gulping in shallow gasps of air, I open the door to the driver's side, yelping when Jake's body slumps onto the pavement. Oh God, I was definitely not expecting that to happen. Hang on. I should check for a pulse. Or should I? He's so clearly dead. Yes, yes, I should. Whimpering slightly, I press a trembling finger against his wrist. I manage to keep it there for all of two seconds before I yank my hand back and wipe it furiously on my shirt. Dead. Very dead. I take another deep breath, fanning at my face, trying to put out the flames in my cheeks, then I reach out and grab Jake's arms. They're still warm. Ugh. Somehow, that makes it so much worse. Bile rushes up but I grit my teeth and pull hard. Thanks to my job, I've had to work out religiously carrying my two heavy cameras plus all those lenses for 10 hours straight as hell on my back and shoulders, so I do everything possible to increase my strength and endurance. I even splurge on a weekly session with Dinah, the best personal trainer that my gym has to offer. Which means when I pull, Jake's body actually moves, surprisingly easily. Dinah would be proud. Okay, Dinah would definitely not be proud of the fact that I can move a 180-pound man whom I've killed. And why am I even thinking of Dinah right now? Because my mind argues as I yank Jake across the pavement, to the back of the car because you need to think of anything and everything else that isn't, holy shit, I'm moving a dead body. Holy shit, I'm moving a dead body. Where? Where do I move him to? I can't leave him here. That's way too cruel. But I can't stomach the thought of having it him in the back seat of the car while I'm driving. I eye the trunk. Okay. Trunk it is. As an afterthought, I take a hoodie that I keep in the back seat and drape it over his face. Jake was an asshole when he was alive, but now that he's dead, I feel an inexplicable need to treat him with respect. I'm going to need so much therapy to unpack all of this. Once I slam the trunk shut and Jake's out of sight, I feel somewhat better. More in control. In control? Who am I kidding? I have a literal corpse in my car. I shake my head. Let's not dwell on that. Shuddering to myself, I slide back into the car. Please, start, please. The engine rumbles to life as soon as I turn the key. My breath releases in a whoosh, and I take a moment to calm down. Or try to, anyway. I'll just drive until I find a payphone, and then I'll call 911. Right. I back out slowly, wincing at the scraping sound my bumper makes along the road. Maybe I should get out and try to fix that, but no. I really can't stomach another second at this cursed spot. My breath is still coming out in shallow, panicked gasps as I drive along the road, and the brighter the streets become, the more panicky I feel. This is nuts. What have I done? I've put a body in the trunk of my car. What would the cops say when I called them? What would I even say? Why the hell did I do that? What kind of sane person would do that? Question after question assaults my mind until a scream rips out of me, and in that instant, I realize, I can't go to the cops. They'll think I'm guilty of murder, that I'm some crazed killer, and they'll arrest me. There's a gas station in the distance. This is my chance. I can stop there, rush inside, and beg for help. But my foot presses down on the gas pedal, refusing to let up, and I zoom right past it. It's as though my subconscious has gotten hold of my body and is forcing it to keep driving, not looking back, until I hit the entrance to the 405. I take it, heart drumming painfully at the familiar road sign, head throbbing as I join the traffic zooming down the freeway. I'm driving down the 405 with a dead body in my trunk. A hysterical laugh bubbles out. 
It sounds cracked, slightly mad. Tears spring into my eyes when I see the sign for the turn. So close to home. To safety. A lump catches in my throat. For the first time in years, I can't wait to get home to Ma. 6. Junior year, six years ago. The stage is set. By stage, I mean our table is groaning under the weight of all the dim sum dishes stacked in the middle and I've poured the tea for everyone, and now, all I need to do is, tell them. Just blurt it out, Medi. Just do it. Do the thing. Um, so. We have a big announcement. Ma says in Mandarin. Her eyes are all twinkly. Seriously, they are like Christmas lights. She claps like an excited child. Oh. I sit back, heart hammering from almost wood vomiting about Nathan. Calm down, heart. I'll try again after their big announcement. Ma nods at Big Aunt, who straightens up regally. She clears her throat. We have decided to make a family business. Um. Okay, wow. That's huge. My mind swims. What business could they possibly put together? All of us, Big Aunt says, and for once, Second Aunt doesn't contradict her. They're all smiling and looking at me. Okay. Okay. Why are they looking at me like that? Dread creeps up my stomach. Oh my god, this is where they tell me they've used the house as collateral against the loans they've taken out for this mystery business. Or maybe the business is dealing coke. Or human trafficking. Wow, I have a low opinion of my family. What's the business? I say, when I can't take the anticipation any longer. Weddings. Fourth aunt shouts, throwing her hands up with a flourish. Big aunt frowns at her. I was about to tell Medi that, Big Aunt scolds. Sorry, Fourth Aunt says, not looking sorry in the least. Weddings? I frown. Yes, Big Aunt says. I'll do the wedding cakes. I already do big birthday cakes, very good ones. I nod slowly, thinking of Big Aunt's towering birthday cakes. She does do good cakes there's no denying that. But the others. I'll do makeup and hair for bride, second aunt says. I have so many loyal customers at the salon. If I quit, they'll all follow me. I'll do the flower bouquets and flower arranging, Ma says. And I'll do the entertainment. Fourth aunt finishes. I have so many fans in the Asian community, you know. No doubt they'll all want to hire me as a wedding singer. Ma rolls her eyes and says in a loud whisper, she's just tagging along. She's family, so we have to give her a job. Says the minimum wage supermarket worker, fourth aunt mutters. The two of them glare at each other until big aunt snaps her fingers between them and says, and Medi, sweet Medi. All eyes turn to me. I shrink back in my chair. Yeah? I squeak. You'll be the photographer. The breath is knocked out of me. I guess I should have seen it coming. Of course they'd want me to be their photographer. It makes sense, I am studying photography, after all. But still. Um. I need a minute. I leap out of my chair and weave through the crowd until I'm outside the restaurant. I gulp in a few deep breaths and try to make the swirling thoughts in my head less swirly. I'm upset, but I don't really know why. I guess there's that part of me that's fighting back and yelling, don't I get to choose what to do with my degree? But then when I actually stop and think about it, I like the idea of doing wedding photography. I guess I'm mostly railing against the fact that they've all made this decision without me. Which is stupid, right? I shouldn't feel angry that they've made a good decision. And it is a good decision, they're right, they can do all those things. Ma's flower arrangements are gorgeous. 
Big Aunt is wasted on birthdays, and Second Aunt does have a loyal following at the salon. As for Fourth Aunt, well, she thinks she's a celebrity, and she does have a decent voice. We could make it work. And as soon as I think that, tendrils of excitement unfurl inside me. We could do this. This could be my family's way out of the crappy little house we're all cramped in. The door to the restaurant opens, noise spilling out. Ma brightens when she spots me. Hey, why did you come outside? I was looking for you in the bathroom, but you weren't there. She peers at me and frowns. She must have sensed that I'm having a moment, because she switches from Indonesian to English. You okay? Why so sad? The fact that she switches to English, despite her not being fluent in it, makes my stomach clench with guilt. She's already sacrificed so much for my sake, and I can't even communicate with her in her mother tongue. I force a smile. I'm not sad. I'm just trying to digest this whole family business thing. Ah, uh, yes. Very big deal. But if you're not interested, it's okay. We don't need photographer. I stare at her. But inside, you guys were like, Mehdi, you should be our photographer. Yes, of course we want you to be our photographer. You are the best photographer. I laugh bitterly. Ma, you don't know that. I'm a total newbie. I'd probably make a mess of everything. It's okay, we are all new babies. We start slow. You do that thing, what is it called? Spirit another photographer. Shadow. Ah, uh, yes. You become a shadow to wedding photographer, you learn first, then when you graduate, you can do this. But if you think, no, I don't like this wedding photography, then no need to join family business, it is okay. I take her hands in mine. It's hard for her to tell me it's okay, that I don't have to join them, because I can see plainly how excited she is about the idea of us all working together. I'll do it, Ma. Really? She looks so happy it breaks my heart. Yeah, of course. I'll look into wedding photography. I want to do this with you. Adu, Sayanku. Ma pulls me into a hug. It's not as tight as the ones Nathan's family gives, but it's sweet in its own way. You make your mama so happy. I hug her back and close my eyes. I guess I'll tell them about Nathan some other time. 7. Present day. sit in the garage for what seems like hours, wondering just how the hell my life has spun so out of control. And what in the world am I even doing here? Why am I home, instead of at the police station? It might not be too late. I could probably still go to the cops, explain everything. They'd be sympathetic, maybe. But when I think about turning the engine back on and driving out of the garage again, every drop of energy leaks out of me. I slump against the wheel, boneless. I just need to stay here for a bit. Gather enough courage. Decide what I would say to the police. There's a sharp knock on the window. I jump so hard I bump my head on the roof of the car. Now I know what the saying jumped out of their skin means. What are you doing in there? You drunk? Adu, were you drunk driving? Ma calls out in Indonesian, her voice muffled through the window. I open the car door, heart thundering. Ma, you scared me. She frowns at me. What is it, Mehdi? What's wrong? I wasn't planning on telling her anything. Of course I wasn't the last person I want to tell is Ma. She wouldn't know what to do, or say, or... Ma. I killed him. Tears spring into my eyes when I hear myself say those words out loud. I killed him. How many more times would I have to say that? Kill him? Kill what? Adu, Mehdi, how many times must I tell you, 
don't drink so much. You see, now you're not making any sense. I killed him, Ma. Jake. The guy you set me up with. And now, finally, I let the tears flow, because saying his name is awful. It's not just somebody in my trunk, it's a body who used to be a someone. Ma stops her nattering mid-sentence. Her mouth claps shut, and she stares at me for a while. When she next speaks, it's in halting English. This is like what you and Selena like to say. You kids always saying, what, well, you killing it? Like that, why eh? No. I cry. I mean I literally killed him, Ma. Not knowing what else to do, I take out my car key and hit a button. The trunk pops open with a click that might as well be a gunshot inside our small garage. All noise is suddenly amplified, I can hear my own heartbeat, and Ma's sharp intake of breath. Medi, she whispers, this is joke, right? You just joking with me. No, Ma, this isn't a joke. A strangled laugh from Ma, then she shakes her head. You kids, why eh, you always think you are so funny. She wags a finger at me and strides to the back of the car, still shaking her head. My daughter, such a joker, so aiya wo de tien ah. She stumbles back, hands covering her mouth. I wince. Medi, she hisses. Medi. This is not funny. She looks back and forth between me and the trunk. Are those fake legs? What you call it Manny Queen? I shake my head, fresh tears springing to my eyes. No, Ma, it's not a mannequin. It's really Jake, I swear. She, she utters a noise that's somewhere between a howl and a whimper, then takes a moment to steal herself before peering closer into the trunk. She whimpers again when she sees the rest of the body. I imagine what she's seeing from her vantage point. First the shoes brown loafers, no socks then the legs, the torso, and then the hoodie covering his face. Why you cover the face, she says. Something horrible happened to it, is it? She shudders. Is there something sticking out of the eye? Aya, don't tell me, I don't want to know. She flaps, grimacing. Is it broken glass in his eye? No, Ma. There's nothing sticking out of his eye. I just thought it would be, I don't know, more respectful. Oh. She nods. Yes, you're right, more respectful. She pats me on the cheek. I raise you so well. Hysteria rises from deep in my stomach and I have to swallow it. Trust Ma to take pride in my etiquette when I've just shown her my date, whom I've killed, in the trunk of my car. I did just kill a person, so I don't know that you can say you've raised me well. Oh, he must deserve it. I bite my lip to keep from bursting into tears again. I'm so grateful that I don't have to explain myself to her. Okay. Ma says, straightening up, all of a sudden in control. She's not even breathing hard anymore. There's a glint in her eye that she gets the week before Chinese New Year, when she goes absolutely berserk and cleans the house like Marie Kondo on crack. You. Inside. Now. She slams the trunk shut and herds me through the back door into the house. Inside, she tells me to sit at the kitchen counter. I follow her instructions, too exhausted and defeated to argue. And, as much as I hate to admit it, I'm glad she's taking over, because I don't know what the hell to do in this situation. So I slump onto a chair, rest my elbows on the kitchen counter, and bury my face in my hands. Please let me wake up and find out that all this was a nightmare. Any moment now. A steaming cup of tea is placed in front of me. TCM, Ma says. You drink now. You got too much young, your inside's very hot. Your breath smells so bad. She shuffles out of the kitchen. I stare at her retreating back. Traditional Chinese medicine, seriously. 
Who would think about bad breath at this particular moment? Still, I take a sip, and the herbal tea is like an elixir, spreading its sweet warmth through my entire body, down to my freezing hands. I take another sip, then another, and before long, I've finished the entire cup and actually feel a little better. Ma strides back into the kitchen. Okay, I call Big Aunt already. She will be here in few minutes. What? I jump out of my chair. Ma, oh my god, I can't believe you did that. She looks genuinely confused for a second, but then her face clears and she laughs, waving me off. Oh, no worry, no worry, she say she will call everyone else for me, okay. Won't just be Big Aunt coming here, you don't worry, all your aunties will come too. What? I cry. I throw my head back and stare up at the ceiling. This can't be happening. Ma, that's not we shouldn't be telling everyone about this. Ma frowns. Not everyone. Just your aunties. That's everyone. Medi, she tuts, disapproving. They are family. It's different. It's murder. I cry. Or, well, not murder, it's more like self-defense, but still. Ma, there's a dead guy in my car. This is not the kind of thing you share with everyone, even if they're family. It's exactly kind of thing you share with family, Ma says. What do you mean, it's exactly the kind of thing you share with family? What other things have you guys shared that are in any way like this? Ma waves me off and says, come, help me cut mango for aunties. If we don't offer any food very ngga enak. Seriously, Ma? You care about saving face right now? I think we're kinda beyond that, aren't we? She gives me a look as she bends down to open up the fruit drawer in the fridge. Medi, how can you say that? Your auntie's coming over, so late at night, coming to help us get rid of body, and we don't even offer them any food. How can? Oh, we have dragon fruit, good, good. Big aunt's favorite. Whoa, got pear too. Very good. Help me peel, don't be so rude to your aunties, you will bring shame. Oh, right, it's the lack of fruit that'll bring shame, not the dead body in the car. But less than a minute later, I'm standing at the kitchen island with a peeler in one hand and a Korean pear in the other. My mind keeps going, boah, this is so surreal. There is a dead body in my car and I'm standing here peeling fruit. For some reason, I continue peeling and cutting. I suppose I might as well, since I don't have any better ideas. Just as I finish cutting up the giant pear, the doorbell chimes. Go get door, Ma says. She's still slicing up the last dragon fruit. I head for the front door, still in that weird I must be dreaming state of mind. I don't even know what to say to my aunts. Thank you for coming to help figure out what to do with this guy I killed. But I'm spared having to say that, because the moment I open the door, Big Aunt pats my cheek and says in Indonesian, My dear Medi, it's okay, don't worry. Go sit down, and then strides past me. Second and fourth aunts follow, each one clucking, Don't worry, we're here now, stop crying. I'm not crying. Second aunt tuts, as though my lack of tears were a personal affront to her, before joining the others in the kitchen. Noise explodes from the kitchen, though not of the oh my god, Medi did what, variety. More of the wa, dragon fruit. Adu, you shouldn't have bothered, variety. I can hear Ma pulling out chairs and shouting merrily at them to sit down and have some mangoes. Agwen gave me a whole crate when he came back from Indo. A whole crate. Taking a deep breath, I steal myself and go into the kitchen. Medi! Big Aunt shouts. Oh God, here it comes. Now they'll start freaking out about the body. Have you eaten? Big Aunt says. Come. 
Come here and sit down. Oh, you look so pale. She gets up from her seat. It's as though a switch clicks on inside me. I automatically hurry over, pushing her back down onto the chair, saying, Please, big aunt, don't bother yourself. I'll grab a chair. You sit and enjoy the fruit, okay. Can I get you anything else? From the corner of my eye, I sense Ma's approval, and it makes me want to laugh out loud and sob. I mean, seriously, I've just killed a man, and she still cares about me being respectful to my elders. Big Aunt spears a sliced mango and takes a dainty bite. Whoa, so good. She takes another bite and sighs. Nothing beats Indonesian mangoes. Yes, Indonesian mangoes are the sweetest, Ma says. Does anyone want herbal tea? I boiled a pot for Medi and I have some left over. TCH, no thanks, I don't believe in the old-fashioned TCM stuff, fourth aunt says. Ma glowers at her. Traditional Chinese medicine is real medicine. She launches into one of her usual tirades about how TCM has been medically proven to work and is much better than Western medicine and so on and so forth. I'm stuck in a nightmare. I know it. Maybe I got a concussion from the accident. Maybe I'm actually in a coma, and my coma brain is coming up with this weird ass scenario, because there is no way that I'm actually sitting here, in the kitchen, watching my oldest aunties eat a mango and ma and fourth aunt argue while Jake lies cooling in the trunk of my car. Just when I'm about to scream, big aunt puts down her fork with a meaningful clatter. Everyone sits to attention. So, she says, turning to me and switching to English. Behind the kindly wrinkles that I know so well I could sketch them in my sleep, her gaze is eagle sharp. Tell Big Aunt what happened. Start from beginning. I don't hesitate. There's just something about Big Aunt, a mix of firm authority and motherly warmth that nobody can say no to. I'm feeling so guilty about having them rush here in the middle of the night to help me with a dead body, no less that I try relaying the story in Indonesian. But not even one sentence in, second aunt tells me my atrocious Indonesian is giving her a headache and I should just stick to English. With some relief, I tell them about my date with Jake, about how he insisted on driving me home, and the things he said. My aunts and mother cover their mouths with horror and shake their heads. How could you set Medi up with such a douch bag? Fourth aunt snaps at Ma. Ma's face is as red as a Lubatin soul. He was so nice online. Perfect gentleman, even offered to cook Taong for me, uh, for Medi. What's Taong? Is that fermented shrimp paste? I say. TCH, no, Ma says, switching to English. Shrimp paste is terrasai. Taong is eggplant. Something clicks inside me. He offered to cook me eggplant. That's weirdly specific. Ma nods furiously. It's why I think, well, this boy is meant for you. He even know what is your favorite food. I need to see these chat messages. Ma takes her phone from her pocket and my aunts all take out their glasses. As Ma hands the phone to me, fourth aunt swipes it from her hand. Hey! Ma says. Fourth aunt ignores her and starts scrolling. Her eyebrows shoot up, almost disappearing in her hairline, and she bursts into hysterical laughter. Why you laugh? What is so funny? Ma snaps. Still laughing so hard she can't catch her breath, fourth aunt pushes the phone to me. I skim through the messages, and... Oh. My. God. It is so much worse than I thought. Jake 1010 Hatelia, hey. Medellin Chan, hello. I look up at Ma, aghast. You used my real name on this site. And is that I tap on the little icon next to my name, 
and it enlarges to show an actual picture of me. I don't know you are supposed to use fake name. How am I supposed to know that? Maybe by not pretending to be me and making a fake dating account. I mean, for God's sake, look, Jake didn't upload any pictures of himself. Ma looks so hurt that I immediately regret saying that. I'm sorry, Ma, I know you just wanted to help. She gives a tiny nod, and I resume reading. Jake 1010 Hatelia, love your pick. Medellin Chan, thank you. You so sweet. I grit my teeth in an effort to not snap at Ma again. How many exclamation marks can the woman use in a single reply? Jake 1010 Hatelia, so, wedding photography, huh? That must be interesting. Medellin Chan, oh yes. Very interesting. What do you do? Jake 1010 Hotelia, as you might have guessed from my screen name, I'm a Hotelia. I own hotels. Many of them, actually. Medellin Chan, wah. So impressed. It goes on like that for a while, Jake bragging, describing in great detail each and every one of the hotels he owns, and Ma replying in the most bimbotic way that's humanly possible. Anyone reading this would think I'm desperate for Jake's approval, but I know that this is Ma being polite. This is how she's raised me, to encourage others to talk about themselves, and then find the good things in what they say and show appreciation. I can't tell whether it's a Chinese thing or an Indonesian thing, but whatever it is, it worked on Jake. After only a few days of messaging back and forth, he sends this message. Jake 1010 Hotelia I feel so comfortable chatting with you, Medi. Medellin Chan, me also. Jake 1010 Hotelia, it's so hard finding someone I really click with, you know. I feel as though I've known you for a long time. Medellin Chan, I agree. Jake 1010 Hotelia, so wanna meet up? Medellin Chan, yes. So happy you ask now. Yesterday my body not tastes so delicious, but today is better. Oh. My. God. Nu. In Indonesian, the phrase Tidak Enak Badan means not feeling well, but its literal translation is body not delicious. Behind me, fourth aunt resumes cackling, while the others go, what? What's so funny? I read on. Jake 1010 Hotelia, oh. Wow, okay. Damn, girl, you're even thirstier than I thought. Medellin Chan, ha ha. No, no, not thirsty. I have a lot to drink. Quite wet now. Jake 1010 Hotelia, wow. Damn. If I'd known, I would have asked you out sooner. Medellin Chan, what? How you know eggplant my favorite? Jake 1010 Hotelia, it is, huh? Well, I've got a real big one for you. Medellin Chan, oh. I can't wait. Love eggplant. I slam the phone down and stare at Ma. Fourth aunt is literally lying on the floor, laughing. What? What is it? Big Aunt says. He sound like very nice boy, offer to cook eggplant for you. Right? Ma cries, gesturing wildly. I read that and I think, whoa, this boy is so lovely, so caring for my daughter, even ask her, is she thirsty? I bury my face in my hands. No. Ma, those emojis the water droplets and the eggplant they are sexual innuendos. Three pairs of eyes stare at me in utter confusion while fourth aunt howls with laughter. Sexual, what? In you and what? Second aunt says. I can't believe I'm having this conversation with my aunts and mom right now. Sexual innuendos. You know, like, sexual wordplay. The eggplant symbolizes the um the male are, the um. 
this is ridiculous. I'm 26, for God's sake, and yet I can't say the word penis out loud in front of my mom and aunts because part of me is sure they'd scold me for saying it. Instead, I use my index finger to airdraw the universal symbol for penis. Eggplant, Big Aunt says. Yes, he say eggplant, we know that. No. She means penis. Fourth Aunt howls, and then doubles over again, laughing. What? Ma gasps. No. But. That sound not right. I think you wrong, Big Aunt says stridently. She snatches the phone from me and frowns at it again. See, he say, if I'd known, I would have asked you out sooner. I've got a real big one oh. She drops the phone on the counter as if it's turned into a cockroach. Ma's standing there, frozen, a look of horror on her face. Ma, you okay? She turns to look at me slowly, then says, in a voice full of horrified wonder, eggplant is penis. Yeah. I sigh, feeling so ashamed of my generation. I thought he mean, you know, fried eggplant. I thought she looks so lost and small that I can't help but feel sorry for her. I put an arm around her shoulders and squeeze. It's okay, Ma. I know. Yes, it's okay, everyone has to learn how to sext at some point, fourth aunt says. I shoot her a dirty look. Sext. Ma says. Don't worry about it, I say, patting her shoulder. So, um. Okay, so this clarifies some things. Not that it excuses Jake's behavior in any way, but I see now why he was so, uh. Horny? Fourth aunt says. She grins when I shoot her another dirty look. Ma's hand flies to her mouth again. Meddy, is it, did I get boy killed because I say I want to eat his eggplant? I open my mouth to answer, but my aunts beat me to it, shouting, N-O, in unison. So what if you say you want to eat eggplant? Second aunt says. Maybe one day you want to eat eggplant, but then another day you don't want, is okay you change mind. Yes, he is very bad boy, very bad, big aunt says. But if I don't say, well, yes, I want to eat your eggplant, then maybe he not so you know. Meddy, when he said those things to you in the car, what did you say to him? Fourth aunt says. I told him no, I wasn't interested in that. I moved his hand off my knee. I was pretty clear about what I wanted and didn't want. See? Fourth aunt says, triumphantly. The eggplant doesn't matter. That was just flirting. Everybody does it. But he chose to take it further after Medi said no. It's not your fault. I nod emphatically. It really isn't your fault, Ma. A tiny voice in my mind says, well, it kind of is, in that if she hadn't impersonated me in the first place. I squash the voice down. No use pointing fingers now. Okay, back to what happened, Big Aunt says. So this baggy douche try touch you. Douchbag, fourth aunt says. Big aunt waves her off. Douchebaggy try touch you. Um, and then I kind of freaked out panicked and uh. I may have tarsed him a little. The pairs of eyes stare at me, horrified. Medi, second aunt breathes. You have taser. I can't help cringing as I nod. Here it comes. They're going to. Can we see? Second aunt says. Huh? Whoa, wonder what model you got, big aunt says. Is it like my one? She picks up her handbag from the kitchen counter and rummages in it, looking over her reading glasses. Fourth aunt sighs. They got distracted again. Hey! She claps at them, like they're raucous puppies. 
Focus. It's very late and we have an early morning. Big Aunt straightens up, clearing her throat. Ah, sorry. You show me Taser later. Okay, so you tase him. You get him where? Neck. Cheek. I gape at her. Um, the neck. They all nod. Always go for neck, Ma says. I hear neck is best place to tase. Very sensitive. Good, Medi. She pats my cheek with approval. It takes a second for me to gather my thoughts from the mess of WTFness. And then, ah, uh, then he crashed the car, and when I came to, he was ah. Uh, well, you know. He die already, Ma says, flatly. None of my aunts seem surprised by this, which means Ma must have told them over the phone before they came, or maybe it means that their my family is a bunch of psychopaths. I choose to go with the former. Then how? Second aunt says. She can say that again. We sit there for a bit, silent, each of us deep in thought. For the record, my thoughts are still stuck in WHY are they so calm what is going on also OMG I killed a man. Big aunt takes off her reading glasses with a sigh. Okay. Where is Jake now? In the trunk of my car, I say, wincing again at how insane it sounds. She nods. Nobody see you, right? I mean, I don't think so. There was no one around. It was a quiet street, I think he chose to go down that street because, ah, uh, you know, he wanted to you know. My aunts and mother all mutter curses in various languages lots of F words being tossed around in Hokkien, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Indonesian. I tell you, ah, uh, Ma hisses, it is good thing he already dead, otherwise I kill him. Even fourth aunt nods in solemn agreement to this. Hearing this makes tears spring to my eyes again. The fact that there's no question among them that I did the right thing in defending myself is as soothing as a tight hug, and I just want to melt in their arms and sob and let them take care of everything. Okay, so we getting rid of body, big aunt says, with her usual authority. Hang on, fourth aunt says, why should we do that? Why not just go to the police? I mean, it sounds like a pretty clear-cut case of self-defense. Ma scowls at her. Yes, we know it is self-defense, but police don't know. They see we got dead body in trunk, they will for sure say, oh my god, you murder him. Fourth aunt glares back at her, opens her mouth to say something, stops, turns to me, and says, why did you put the body in the trunk? Despite being the youngest of the lot, fourth aunt is still formidable. All the women in my family are. Except for me, I guess. I quail under her gaze, my voice coming out flimsy. Um. I freaked out. I didn't want to wait another second longer for someone to come by, my phone was dead, and I didn't want to drive back with it next to me. In hindsight, I guess I made the absolute worst choice I could have made. No, worst choice is you leave him there, on side of the road, second aunt says. Oh, yes, that one even worse, Ma says, nodding gratefully at her before shooting fourth aunt another dirty look. Fourth aunt ignores her. Surely if we go to the cops and explain everything, they'll see that Medi is no killer. Look at her. I'm suddenly the subject of four pairs of shrewd eyes once more. I try my best to not cringe away from the attention. Big Aunt exchanges a look with Ma. Though the question is unspoken, I know what she's asking Ma, it's your daughter, what do you want to do? Ma straightens up. We are not going to police. No, I don't trust them. We don't know what they say. They might say she temperating the body. Tampered with the body, you mean, fourth aunt says. Ma shoots her a look of pure venom. 
they might say she blocked justice. Obstructed justice, fourth aunt says. It's very clear what I mean. Ma snaps. Yes, we know your English is very good, no need to show off, okay. Fourth aunt throws her arms up. I'm just helping. Big aunt catches her eye and gives a small shake of the head, and immediately fourth aunt deflates, her breath coming out in an angry sigh. She mumbles, do whatever you want. It's as though there's a fire under my skin. My cheeks are red hot. My mom and aunt are fighting because of me. I mean, okay, Ma has never gotten along with fourth aunt, and they fight every chance they get, but still, it sucks to be the reason they're fighting now. Big aunt nods. Okay, no police. Come, we go see body. 8. Senior year, four years ago. And they say want 12 Lily Tower. Ma practically shouts at me over the phone. Wow, that's amazing, Ma, I say, lowering the volume on my phone to the minimum. I can't see her face. As usual, she's got the camera pointing too high, so it's only showing her forehead and her permed bangs. Yes, it all goes so well, Mehdi. When you finish school and come home, it will go even better, especially then we have photos of everything we done. I don't even have to force my smile. The family business, sans me, has been surprisingly successful. I have to admit that my mom and aunts have exceeded my expectations, even though I was somewhat dubious about the idea to begin with. I've been helping out here and there whenever I'm home, taking as many photos as I can of Mars flower arrangements and big aunt's cakes. I even set up a website for them. It doesn't look half bad, but I can't wait to be able to spend a lot more time streamlining everything and making it look all shiny and impressive. Weirdly, I'm actually really looking forward to graduating and plunging headfirst into the business. Who would have thunk it? There's a knock at my door. A second later, Nathan pops his head in. I quickly tell Ma I have to go and cut the call short. Still haven't told her about Nathan. I figured we're so close to graduating, and once we do, I'll definitely tell them about Nathan because he'll be coming round to our house all the time. With them constantly fussing over him, I'd lose him to them. So for now, I choose to be selfish again. Keep him all to myself. Just for the time being. There's plenty of time to serve him up to the sharks. At least with graduation looming, Nathan stopped asking when I'll introduce him to my family. He knows it won't be long now, so he can afford to be patient. I've got news, Nathan says, dimples on full assault as he walks in. Oh? Three years together and the sight of him still makes my breath catch. Maybe I have asthma. I shouldn't still be so breathless around such a long-term boyfriend. But seriously, those stupid dimples. They should be outlawed. No horny face, he scolds, grinning. Not yet, anyway. He takes both of my hands in his. Okay, so. You know how I was interning at JLL last summer? I gasp. Did they offer you a position? That's awesome. I knew they would. They did. I squeal and leap into his arms, and he lifts me right off the floor, laughing. Wait, I'm not done telling you the offer yet. I'm peppering his entire face with kisses, so I miss the next thing he says. Or rather, I hear it, but my brain says, does not compute. I pause mid-kiss. Come again? It's in New York. That's where their headquarters are. I owe. Can you put me down? He does so, gently, and the second my toes touch the floor, I start pacing about the small room. Thoughts race through my head at Nathan's muse. What does it mean? It means, dumbass, that he's going to move to New York. Wait, does it mean that? 
He hasn't said he accepted. But how can he not accept? It's the biggest business consulting company in the country, if not the world. And it's New York. But what about his dream of staying here in California and opening a hotel? What about it? It was obviously just that, a dream. You okay? Nathan says, rubbing his hands up and down my arms. I wasn't actually done telling you stuff. Oh? My head pops up like a meerkat. Maybe he's going to tell me he got an even better offer, from an even bigger consulting firm that I have never heard of. Which would be totally plausible. Nathan's eyes grow soft, and he takes my hands again. I'd love it if you'd come with me, Medi. My mouth drops open. No sound comes out of it. My mind, whatever's left of it, has short-circuited. Medi? Hem. Did I break you? He waves a hand right in front of my face. Hey. Sorry. What? Come with you? To New York? Yeah, he laughs. Come with me. We'll explore the Big Apple together. We can get an apartment together, we'll wake up next to each other every morning. I'll make you a latte and get you fresh bagels every day. It's a great city for photographers. You'd have your work in galleries, Medi, I know it. You're brilliant. My knees grow weak. God, I want all those things so badly. I want me and Nathan in a tiny New York City apartment with exposed brick walls and wood floors and those old school radiators. But. New York. That's so far away, it might as well be another country. What would Ma do without me? I'd be no better than my male cousins, leaving home as soon as they could. No, I'd be even worse, because I gave Ma and my aunties false hope led them to believe that I'd stay before ripping their hearts right out. Ma would be devastated. Big Aunt would shake her head with disappointment and say, Whoa, oh, turn out girl not blessing. Same as boy, leave us behind. And second aunt and fourth aunt would give me disapproving looks as they comfort Ma. No, I'm better than my cousins. Better than my uncles and I sure as hell am better than my father. I won't abandon my family. Not for love, not for anything. I... I pause. I can't just tell Nathan that I won't go with him to New York. What if he decides to stay in California because of me? I can't do that to him. I won't. I won't make him give up his dreams for me, not when I'm not prepared to give up mine for him. And let's not forget about the curse. I've always known our relationship is doomed, that there will come a time when Nathan will leave me. I should take matters into my own hands and make sure this will work out okay for Nathan. As it should. It's too good of an opportunity for him. The thought makes me want to vomit, but it's clear what needs to happen. This, then, will be my gift to Nathan. I turn away from him. I can't do this while looking at his beautiful, beloved face. I make myself laugh a little. Well, that's good. I, ah, uh, I wasn't sure how to tell you this before, but um. I think it's best if we, um, if we break up. Yeah. What? My gaze darts toward him, just long enough to register the plain shock on his face. Yeah, we've been together like basically all of our adult lives. I kind of want to see what else is out there. Don't you? Nathan looks like he could put his fist through the wall. No, I don't. What the hell, Medi? My chest squeezes like a fist, threatening to crush my heart, my lungs. I struggle to breathe. I'm sorry, I was planning to tell you after graduation but this feels like a good time. Now that you're going to New York, and I'll be staying in LA, it's all for the best, you know? His face is a picture of pain and betrayal. No, I don't know. What the how long have you been feeling this way? 
it's a struggle to keep from falling apart. I swallow the lump in my throat. Don't cry. Don't fucking cry. Um, a while. A while. He gapes at me for a bit, then barks a mirthless laugh. Jesus. He shakes his head and rakes a hand through his hair. Takes a long, shuddering breath. I was gonna. He shakes his head again. Never mind. I am gonna go. I'll, ah, uh, come by for my stuff later. Or something. I manage a small okay and stay unmoving as he leaves my room. Dear God, what have I just done? I feel as though everything inside me has just been scooped out, leaving me an empty husk of a person. I can't watch. I can't stay here and look as the boy I love walks out of my life. But I do. As the tears finally fall, I make myself stare, because I know it'll be the last time I see Nathan, and I don't want to miss a single second of him, even when he's leaving me. 9. Present Day Fourth Aunt packs up a little as we walk out of the kitchen. I've never seen a dead guy before, she says. You are too young, Big Aunt says. Wait until you are fifty, then all your friend parents here die there die, then you see dead people all the time. Well, obviously I've been to funerals before. I've seen bodies in coffins. This is different. I mean I've never seen a dead guy who isn't you know, at a funeral. A couple of steps away from the garage, second aunt suddenly gasps and says, wait. Cannot go out there. We all jump, and in the ensuing silence, I swear I can hear all of our hearts beating a mad rhythm. What is it? Ma says. Second aunt's face is stricken. We cannot see the body. Cannot go near it. Why not? Fourth aunt demands, obviously irritated. She glances with anticipation at the garage. Tomorrow is big wedding weekend. So unlucky if we are near dead body now, and then we bring the bad luck to the wedding, how can? We will curse bride and groom and their whole family. Fourth aunt groans. Not this superstitious BS again. I don't usually agree with fourth aunt, but I very nearly groan out loud with her, because as soon as second aunt says it, both ma and big aunt actually pause to consider what she's saying. My pulse goes so fast I feel as though I might faint. I can't believe I might end up going to prison because of a superstition. But isn't the belief that you shouldn't go to a wedding after you've been to a funeral? I point out. My aunt's eyebrows rise. I mean, this isn't a funeral, technically. We're not doing any burial rites or anything. Eyes shining, Ma snaps her fingers and points at me. Medi is correct. We just don't bury body now. We maybe we put him in freezer. Then on Monday, after wedding, we can bury body. Fourth Aunt Blanches. Ah, hang on, I didn't mean. Big Aunt nods. Okay, it sound good. Second Aunt chews her lip, hesitating, and Big Aunt glares at her. And anyway, Big Aunt says, since hotel owner die, wedding probably cancelled tomorrow, when he not show up. So we be back early, then we bury body. With that, they resume walking toward the garage, fourth aunt leading the charge, second aunt being pushed along by Ma, me trailing at the back. Ah, you leave light on, Big Aunt says, walking through the back door into the garage. Yes, dead body cannot be in the dark, Ma says. Big Aunt nods. Yes, good thinking. More superstitious BS, Fourth Aunt mutters. Just wait until you see what Medi do to the body. She was very respectful, Ma says. I can't believe she's taking this moment to boast about me being respectful. This is peak Asian parenting. We all crowd around the trunk of the car. My breath catches, my chest painfully tight, 
not enough room for my lungs to expand and take in air. I think I might faint. As though sensing my near panic, Ma pats my arm before opening the trunk. And there he is, just as I left him, lying in there with his long legs bent, knees at his waist, the hoodie covering his face. There is a mix of noises from my aunt's big auntie's TCH thing and shaking her head, muttering, this what happen when parents don't raise the son well, fourth aunt is staring open-mouthed with what I can only describe as horrified glee, and second aunt is. What are you doing, second aunt? She hardly glances at me as she goes into a deep lunge. Snake creeps through the grass, she mutters. What? She doing Tai Chi, Ma says. Doctor tell her do it for high blood pressure. Ah. Okay. I suppose we all have our ways of dealing with stress. Fourth aunt reaches toward the hoodie, and Ma smacks her hand. Ow. What? What do you think you're doing? Ma demands. Isn't it obvious? I want to see his face. Aya. You so disrespectful. People already dead, you want to see his face for what? She's right, Mimi, Big Aunt says, gently. We try not to disturb him too much. I have to turn away from the body. The sight of it brings back the trauma of the accident, and I can't stop seeing flashes of Jake, again and again. Of him smiling, his hand on my knee. Now his hands are lying limply against his hips. Now, now what? Second aunt says, going through her Tai Chi moves a lot faster than they call for. This boy's so tall. How we get rid of him? She shudders before going into a different pose with arms outstretched. Maybe we can chop him up cook some curry, then throw away bit by bit. That's a lot of curry, fourth aunt says. My stomach latches. Calm. Down. They're not being serious. They're not. They're just being their usual selves. Their usual murdery selves. What is going on right now? Maybe one of the Chinese dramas they're always watching is a crime show. Or maybe this is a mom thing, once you have a kid, you lose the ability to be truly shocked by anything. I mean, this is not normal, right? Right? No curry, big aunt scolds. Second aunt glares at her. You got better idea is it? Second aunt says. Big aunt sighs. I think first. Um, I squeak and they all look at me. I charge ahead before I lose whatever tiny bit of courage I have. Maybe we should take him to the desert and bury him there. They mull this over. We've been on family trips to Vegas a couple of times, we all know the route well, the empty desolation between California and Nevada that people pass through and never stop at. Good idea, Ma says, smiling with obvious pride at me. Second aunt nods. Yes, very good. Better than your curry idea, big aunt chides. Okay, we do that when we come back from Wedding Island. Definitely got no time to do tonight, we need to be at pier tomorrow by 8.30. Oh my god. In all the panic and confusion, I haven't forgotten that we still need to work a wedding tomorrow but I have forgotten the details of it the fact that it's at Santa Lucia and that we have to congregate tomorrow morning at the pier to catch one of the private yachts that will be taking us to the island. The thought of it exhausts me. Driving to the desert, digging a hole, filling it, and then driving back is out of the question for tonight. As it is, I can barely stay on my feet. We cannot leave him in trunk for whole weekend, Ma says. Later he will stink up my house then will be very hard to get rid of smell. Big Aunt nods again. We need to put him in fridge. Lord help me, we are literally talking about fridging the dude. My refrigerator not big enough, Ma says. Only you got fridge big enough, Second Aunt says to Big Aunt. 
The only sign that betrays Big Aunt's dismay at the realization that it would have to be her fridge is a flicker of displeasure, but then she nods and says, okay. Anyway, I will feel better with body in my fridge than if body in someone else's fridge, who knows, maybe that person is not so responsible. She gives second aunt the side eye. Second aunt's nostrils flare and she opens her mouth to speak, but big aunt says, we go now. Um, could we move him into your trunk? I say. It's pretty obvious my car's been in an accident, and I don't want us to get pulled over. Okay. My car already in your driveway. Come, we move him. We all crowd around Jake's body. We can't carry him out like this, I say. What if someone sees? Yes, cover him with something, second aunt says. Nat, you got big bag or not? You know, when Hendra go ski, he take his ski in this very big bag. I always think, well, can fit me inside that bag. Why you think that? Such unlucky way of thinking, big aunt scolds. Before second aunt can smark back at big aunt, Ma quickly cuts in. No, Medi don't ski. Maybe garbage bag. Can it fit or not? We regard the body. I think he's a bit tall to fit in a trash bag, Ma, I say. We'd have to cut him up first, fourth aunt says, her eyes shining with what I can only describe as horrified glee. Has she always been this murderous? Have they always been this blasé about chopping bodies up? Such silly idea, Ma scoffs. So messy, and the garbage bags always leak. You will make big mess in my garage. That's because you always buy the cheap ones, fourth aunt shoots back. I told you to buy Glad brand. Haven't you seen their ads? Glad bags will hold his cut-up body just fine, no leaks. I look at the ceiling. Pretty sure that when Glad was planning their marketing campaign, they didn't think their target market would be a bunch of middle-aged Chinese women arguing about how to best dispose of a body. What about a blanket? I say. We just need something to cover him while we move him to Big Aunt's car. All it has to do is make him look less like a dead body. Good idea, Big Aunt says. Ma flushes with pride. The woman really needs to get her priorities straight. I run back inside the house, grab a couple of old blankets from our storeroom, and rush back into the garage, where they've moved on from the trash bag issue to arguing over some other thing. Here it is. I say loudly. I pass one blanket to Big Aunt and shake out the other. We approach the body, blankets raised, and pause. Fourth Aunt growls, come on, do it. Teeth gritted, I put my blanket over the top half of his body. Tuck the sides under him, fourth aunt says. Wrap him up like a burrito. Oh God, I whimper, but I do as she says, tucking the blanket underneath his body, cringing at how warm it feels. He's still warm, I hiss, face scrunched in revulsion. I hesitate. Should we ah? Uh? I think we should check his pulse. No, no, that very bad luck, touching corpse, Ma says, shaking her head firmly. I stare at her. What are you talking about? I literally just touched it. Can I also point out you guys were talking about cutting him up moments ago? Would that not involve touching him? Is different, Ma says. Everyone else save for fourth aunt nods. How is it different? I cry. Touching dead body to cut it up, get rid of it, is okay. But touching dead body to try and find life inside, oh, very bad luck. What? I swear my head has exploded. How is cutting up a dead body better than just a small touch to make sure it's actually dead? Aya, if you don't understand, no use trying to explain, second aunt says. When someone doesn't understand, that's exactly the time you should explain. I shake my head. 
Why am I wasting precious time arguing with them? Without giving myself time to chicken out, I grab Jake's wrist, cringing, and feel for a pulse. Ah, oh, God, this is so gross. I feel about, pressing here and there, but my hand is trembling too hard and my palm is all sweaty and. Suda. Ma snaps, yanking my hand back. While still holding on to me, she reaches over and knocks on the door, saying, Adu, knock on wood, why my daughter insist on bringing bad luck on us? Knock on wood dare. Aya, come here, give that to me. He's clearly dead. Fourth aunt pushes me aside and grunts as she lifts Jake's upper body. Ooh, he is still warm. Interesting. Would have thought he'd have gone all stiff. Must be because it's such a warm night. Medi, pull the blanket round from underneath him yes, okay, good. Top wrapped. Let's do the legs. We're all staring at her, dumbfounded. Fourth aunt is a D-list singer, a total diva with big hair and tight, sequined clothes. Being efficient with wrapping up dead bodies is not a quality I would have guessed her to have. But her tone is so authoritative that even big aunt obeys without question. We lift Jake's legs until fourth aunt finishes wrapping the second blanket around them. When we're done, we all step back with a visible shudder. Right, to D.A.G.S. car. Fourth aunt says. I stop Ma in time from opening the garage door, telling her I'm going to turn off all the lights first. Oh, yes, good thinking, she says, clearly rattled by the whole experience. My heart twists at the sight of her lined face. I've done this to her. I've made her worry. The least I can do is try to fix it, try to stay on top of things. Once the lights are off, we open the garage door, wincing at the whirring noise. We should have just carried the body through the house and gone out through the front door. God, I hope the garage door's crazy loud wood doesn't wake any neighbors. Let's go, I whisper. I brace myself and, before I can chicken out, grab the top half of Jake's body. He seems so much heavier than I remember. How the hell did I even manage to carry him out of the driver's seat and into the trunk in the first place? Adrenaline. Right. My blood might as well have been Red Bull at the time. I could have moved boulders if I'd had to. But now, hours after the accident, I'm exhausted, my arms nudely, my legs stiff and slow. I managed to lift Jake's torso a few inches up, my muscles trembling hard. I can't do this on my own, I gasp, and I'm about to drop him when Ma catches his head. Er uh, yeah, you take his hips, she barks. Dag, yeah, you take his legs. Big Aunt rushes to take Jake's legs, as she's told, but Second Aunt is frozen, her eyes wide. I can't I don't Big Aunt snorts, and Second Aunt glares at her. What? I don't want touch dead body, is that wrong? Your family in need and you don't even want to help, Big Aunt says. You tell me, is wrong or no? It's okay, I'll take the hips, Fourth Aunt says, running forward. She waves Second Aunt away. You open D.A.G.'s trunk. She lifts, and together we heave Jake out of the trunk. It's hard to describe the walk to Big Aunt's car, which, as promised, is waiting for us just a few feet away. Jake is heavy, warm, and limp, and even under the layers of blankets, I'm acutely aware that we're carrying a dead human. We're moving as fast as we can, but we have to adjust to one another's speeds, which slows us down. Any moment now, Mr. Kim next door is going to wake up, get a glass of water from his kitchen, glance out the window, and see us. Or maybe, from across the street, Mabel's chihuahua will wake up and ask to go outside. Somehow, we manage to make it to Big Aunt's trunk without any neighbor shouting hey, what are you doing? Through unspoken agreement, we lower him gently instead of dropping him unceremoniously. I guess we have hearts after all, even though we've just moved a dead body.
10. Present day. The drive to Big Aunt's Bakery, which is only a 10-minute walk away from ours, is tense and interminable. Ma, Fourth Aunt, and I are all squished up in the back seat, and nobody says anything. Big Aunt's Bakery is on Valley, a few blocks away from the huge Ranch 99 supermarket. It sits in between a beauty salon, which conveniently belongs to Second Aunt, and a florist, which conveniently belongs to Ma. She parks at the back of the bakery, and we spill out of the car. I take big gulps of air, grateful to be out of the suffocating, thick silence of the car. This time of night, there are no cars around, nobody in sight. It's as though the entire world is asleep and this moment belongs to us, this awful, dark moment that will forever be tucked into my memories as the worst night of my life. I'm so grateful that I have my family with me. It's a strange thought to have as we heave Jake out of Big Aunt's trunk and move him, with much difficulty, across the parking lot and through the bakery's back door. Big Aunt locks the door behind us and turns on the lights. Brilliant white light fills the kitchen, blinding us. Hey ya! Uh, turn off lights. Someone will see. Ma cries. Nobody will see, got no windows back here, Big Aunt says. Put him down there no, not there, too close to my flower. Yes, there, okay. Make sure he not touch anything. With that, she hurries over to the giant industrial-sized refrigerator. She pulls the handle and opens the heavy door with some effort. We crowd around behind her and... Whoa, Ma says. Very beautiful. I can only nod, speechless at the towering piece of art that stands in refrigerated glory before me. It's stunning eight tiers of perfectly round cake covered with flawless buttercream, each layer made to look like poured marble in different shades of dusk pink and grey. Flowers adorn it in a gently weaving cascade peonies and hydrangeas and roses, all made with loving hands out of sugar paste, their petals as thin as tissue paper. It's incredible. I've seen Big Aunt's wedding cakes plenty of times before, of course, but she's outdone herself. She's always been good at her job, but this isn't just a cake, it's pure artwork. It's amazing, Big Aunt, I breathe. It's perfect. This is your best yet, Fourth Aunt says. Big, Big Aunt is way too traditional to show pleasure at compliments. She waves our compliments off, muttering, our massa is nothing. But there's just the tiniest quirk to the corners of her lips that makes it obvious that she's fighting off a huge smile. Is not bad, Second Aunt grunts and the quirk leaves Big Aunt's mouth. Big Aunt's expression hardens. Anyway, no room in fridge for body. Then how? Just move cake out, Second Aunt says. Is covered in fondant, it can last forever outside refrigerator. Is not fondant, Big Aunt says, smirking triumphantly. I know maybe you think is fondant because the surface so smooth, right? But is buttercream. Bride say no fondant, I say no problem, I can do buttercream. Customer always first. I can't believe it's not fondant, I cut in. There's no telling how long Big Aunt's speech would go on for, left unchecked. Big Aunt's right, we can't risk the cake spoiling. Maybe we could put the body in one of the coolers until morning, and then once the cake's out, we can transfer the body into the fridge. Big Aunt turns the idea over, chewing on her bottom lip. Can tomorrow Xiaoling and move a man come over at 7.30, move cake into van, then you all can come and help move body into fridge. I cringe at the thought of Xiaoling, a spry young pastry chef that Big Aunt hired to be her assistant, being in the same room as the dead body. We'll have to make sure she and the mover don't go anywhere near the wrong cooler. Big aunt sighs. Dead body in my fridge, so unhygiene. A crushing wave of guilt nearly knocks me off my feet at the trouble I'm causing everyone. I'm so sorry, big aunt. I'll buy you a new fridge, or pay for this one to be professionally cleaned afterward. Adieu, 
don't so silly, is okay. She goes to the shelves, where there are three giant coolers and numerous boxes stacked in neat rows. She points to the biggest cooler and waves us over to help slide it out. It's a monstrous thing, easily big enough for Jake, provided we're able to fold his legs up, which is a hell of a thing to think of, but here we are. We look at one another and nod. This is it. We unwrap Jake from the blankets and carry him to the cooler. It takes a few tries, a lot more arguing from my aunts and mom, and quite a few curse words, but finally, Jake's in. Fortunately, because it's such a warm night, we're able to fold all of Jake's limbs easily enough, though we did have to take off his shoes. We fold the blankets up neatly and put them on top of him, covering him from sight, and then Big Aunt gets us to pile all sorts of baking supplies on top of the blankets, covering them. By the time we're done, we're all sweaty and the cooler looks like it's filled with bags of flour and confectioner's sugar. She writes out, cannot open on a post-it and sticks it to the top of the cooler. If you write cannot open, people will surely open, second aunt says. Big aunt glowers at her. Maybe you one of those people opening things not theirs, but most people more better than that. Second aunt tuts and grabs the pen. She writes down on a new post-it note, baking supplies, no open, have to be cold and slaps it down on top of big aunt's original note. That, that's probably fine. I say, quickly. Thank you, big aunt. Thank you, second aunt, I say in Indonesian. They've helped me move some guy I killed, the least I can do is thank them in their preferred language. I turn to fourth aunt and ma and thank them too. Aya, thank us for what, we did nothing, big aunt says, waving me off. You literally just helped me move a dead body. I don't know how to put into words what I'm feeling, so I give her a big hug, tears shimmering in my eyes. We're not usually big touches in my family, but Big Aunt accepts the hug fully, her strong arms encircling me tightly. Thank you, I whisper. Why eh, Sayang, she says, patting the back of my head. We let go and push the cooler back next to the other coolers, and then pile sacks of flour on top of it. By the time we're done, it looks like the world's most innocent cooler, definitely not like one that contains a dead human inside it. Tomorrow we come back here 7.45. Xiaoling will be finish up with move, and then we move body into fridge and I lock it, big aunt says. She mutters to herself, must bring lock. Even second aunt nods in agreement without snarking at big aunt. We're all so tired by this time that we're swaying a little on our feet. Bed has never seemed so good to me. It's a good thing that we all live on the same street. Big Aunt drives us back, dropping us off at our respective homes, and Ma and I shuffle, zombie-like, into the house. I just about manage to peel off my sweaty clothes and take a scalding hot shower before trudging into my bedroom. I'll have to deal with the clothes tomorrow. Burn them or something. Same with my car. Clean it, burn it, whatever it is, I don't have the energy to deal with it now. At the sight of my beautiful, cozy bed, my muscles turn to water and I fall, face first, into the pile of pillows. Only then does it hit me that we've forgotten to search for Jake's cell phone. Shit. I make a mental note to retrieve it first thing in the morning. We have time. When we move the body from the cooler into the fridge, there will be plenty of time to find his phone, if it's on him. The last thought I have right before exhaustion knocks me out is, I got through it. Nothing could be worse than tonight. The worst is over. 11. Present day. D.Y. Medi. Ma's voice slices through the room, shattering my sleep. What? I mumble, blinking and grimacing at the bright sunlight. Is it morning already? I feel like I could easily sleep for a whole week. What time is it? Time to go. You get up now. 
we need move body and then go to pier. The events of last night come back in a dizzying, sickening rush. Jake, the car crash, the oh god the body. I bury my face in my hands. It wasn't a dream. It really did happen. I really did kill a man, and my family helped me move the body. Ma bustles in and puts a glass of juice in my hands. I make herbal tea for you. Wake you up. Sepat, drink. I do as she says. Too tired and dazed to argue, and I hate to admit it, but she's right. The TCM drink, whatever she's put in it, does perk me up a little, sliding hot and bitter down my throat. I finish it and have a shower, and by the time I'm dressed in my usual all-black photographer outfit, I feel more or less human and ready to face the gruesome task that awaits us. I send a quick text to Seb, my second photographer, to make sure he's ready for the day. He's supposed to get to the resort an hour after I do, to take pictures of the groomsmen while I handle the bridal party. Seb replies with a thumbs up emoji. I pack my gear in the car before driving to Big Aunt's Bakery with Ma. As soon as we walk in through the back door, it becomes obvious something's wrong. Big Aunt and Second Aunt are already there, and they're snapping at each other in Indonesian, so deep into their argument that they don't even look up when we walk inside. Oi! Ma has to yell above their voices. Suda! Done, stop! Stop arguing, what is it? Second aunt scoffs and releases a laugh that sounds more like a cough sob. You tell them, she says, glaring at big aunt. You tell them what happened. Dread is like a stone deep in my belly, hard and jagged. I try to swallow, but my mouth is a desert. Whatever big aunt's about to say, I don't want to hear it. Big aunt's voice comes out hushed, trembly. Xiaoling and the mover came early. And. I've never in my life heard big aunt's voice falter, but now it does. And they took the cooler. Second aunt crows. You should have come earlier so you could supervise, but you didn't. Her eyes are bright with triumph as she turns to us and says, she overslept. Big Aunt doesn't meet our eyes as she mumbles, I was so exhausted after last night that I slept through my alarm. Ma and I stare in dismay at the spot where we'd pushed the cooler to last night, and sure enough, it's empty, all three coolers gone. It strikes me that this is bad news for all of us, including Second Aunt, but not even such catastrophic news is enough to distract her from the rare opportunity of rubbing Big Aunt's nose in it. So irresponsible. Second aunt says. Big aunt bristles visibly. I'm irresponsible, she hisses. Ma jumps in between her and second aunt. Okay, Suda, cue cup. She flaps her hands for a bit. You better call Xiaoling now, quickly. I already did. She said the coolers have all been loaded up to the yacht. Big aunt sighs. She sounded so happy and proud to have done everything without my help. Adu, Jamana Waye. We'll go to the pier now. Maybe the yacht hasn't left yet. Ma cries. It's left. We're told this after we arrive at the pier, sweaty and out of breath from running from the parking lot. But hey, no worries, the hotel what's the correct title here, yacht organizer. Says. There's another one coming in about five minutes. You ladies are early. The one that left fifteen minutes ago was just cargo, right? You're not scheduled to travel for another half hour, he says, checking his tablet. We like to play it safe, get places early, I wheeze. So, um, what happens to the cargo once it gets to the island? What cargo you got? I exchange a glance with Big Aunt. Um, cakes, mostly. There's the giant wedding cake and, um, a bunch of other desserts. Okay, that stuff will go straight to the kitchen. We've got orders to put them in the walk-in fridge. Sound good to you? I nod weakly. 
Perfect. How everything go? Big Aunt says. Go okay. The yacht organizer smiles brightly. Yeah, everything's going great. 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 We trudge a few paces away from the guy and go into a huddle. They not know Jake is, you know Big Aunt mimes a cutting motion across her neck. Big Aunt. I hiss. Be more subtle, please. Just to play it safe, I switch to Indonesian. Okay, I say. Kami palua miki a plan. Wow, my Indonesian sucks. I try switching to Mandarin. Wo men shu yao um, siong a plan. Ma sighs. I spend so much money on Chinese class for you, all wasted. I give her a sheepish smile. Um, so, a plan? Aya, so simple, second aunt says in Mandarin. As soon as we get there, we'll find the cooler and one of us can take it back here. See? Easy. Easy, big aunt sniffs, shaking her head. I don't think it'll be that easy. Why not? Second aunt says, raising her chin. Big aunt shrugs. Because it's never easy. Otherwise people would get away with murder all the time. I wince at the word murder, even though she said it in Mandarin. And even though I want to have faith in second aunt's simple plan of get there, find Kula, bring Kula back, I have a feeling that big aunt is right. When it comes to hiding a dead body, it's never simple a lesson I'm quickly learning from the previous night. We gather our stuff from the back of the car and wait for the yacht to arrive. When it does, we sit in silence as the boat roars back to life and heads off from the mainland. Fourth aunt, being the entertainment, won't be due at the island until this evening, so big aunt tells me to update her through our family WhatsApp. Of course, I can't say anything incriminating over WhatsApp, so I type out a cryptic. Hi, fourth aunt, there's been a bit of a hiccup. We're headed to the island early. Call me when you get this. Ma, reading over my shoulder, gives a loud sigh. She won't see until she wake up afternoon, that lazy bum. Fourth aunt is the one who gets to sleep in during wedding season and the one who gets the most recognition for her work, and Ma won't ever forgive her for it, even though it's technically not fourth aunt's fault. Fourth aunt leaves rubbing that in Ma's face. I guess their beef is like big aunt versus second aunt, going back decades, far older than me and my cousins. It's a typical SoCal spring day, sunny and sweltering, wisps of white clouds in the deep blue sky. I stare out at the vast ocean, at the distant strip of land that I can hardly believe is the mainland. From this distance, it looks so small. For a moment, I almost feel better, escaping from everything that's happened back home, but when the island of Santa Lucia comes within sight, reality crashes back in. I'm not leaving my troubles behind. They're right here, awaiting me. And for all I know, maybe Xiaoling, well-trained helper that she is, would unpack everything. The thought of her doing that is so vivid. I can practically see her doing it, humming as she opens up the cooler. She'll bend down, remove all the packets of sugar and bric-a-brac we piled on top of the blankets, until she reaches the blankets. Maybe she'll stop with a confused frown why would there be a blanket here and then she'll pull the blanket up, and a loud horn bellows, and I jump up as though I've been electrocuted. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Santa Lucia. We hope you enjoy your stay with us at the Iona Lucia. Gathering my heavy camera bag, I help Ma and the aunties to their feet. They're all a bit wobbly on the yacht, and cling to my arms as we make our way off the boat. We stagger across the bridge. At the pier, we're greeted by another hotel manager holding a tablet. The chans, I gather, he says, eyeing my camera bag. Yes. He gives my family a once-over, then points to Big Aunt. Cake and pastries, he says. My heart bursts into a gallop. Oh God. This is it. 
He's going to tell us that they've found the body, and then cops will jump out from behind those columns lining the pier, and then. Big Aunt must be on the same train of thought as I am, because she's frozen, a look of horrified uncertainty on her face. Hello, cake and pastries, he repeats. He turns to me, wearing an expression that says help me out here. Um, is there a problem with the cake and pastries? I say. He frowns. No. Why would there be, he says snidely. We all visibly sag with relief. Yeah, she's the baker, I say. Good. That wasn't so hard, was it, he snorts, then hands Big Aunt an ID with her name and the word baker on it. Wear this at all times. He turns to Ma. And who are you? Flowers, she says. Florist, I add. Okay, here's your ID, and you would be the hair and makeup, he says, turning to second aunt, who nods quickly. He hands her an ID and then gives me the last one. I turn it over in my hand, marveling at how meticulously planned this wedding is. I don't think I've ever done a wedding where we've had to wear ID cards on a lanyard before. I have question, second aunt says. The guy visibly sighs. Yes. Um, your boss he okay? He very fierce. He in bad mood today. He stares at her with the world's bitchiest expression. I mean, I don't know, it's not like we're besties or anything. She leans closer. So you not see him today? Ah, oh, I don't know. I'm a busy guy. I don't keep track of everyone who comes on and off the yachts. Isn't that literally your job? Keeping track of who comes on and off the yacht? I say. He shoots me a glowering look and says, anyway, here's your buggy. You guys should go now. Toodles. We clamber up into the buggy, exchanging meaningful looks with one another. Still no luck finding out whether or not the hotel knows that Jake's not turning up today. It hits me that I don't even know if they're expecting him here. Last night, he told me that this is his seventh resort so it's not like he's expected to turn up at every function that's being held at one of his hotels. But then this is his most ambitious project so far an entire island owned by him, and this is the first wedding the resort is hosting, and the bride's parents are personal friends, so surely he'd be expected to show up and make sure that everything runs smoothly. Which means that at some point, someone will go, where's Jake? Why isn't he here yet, and then someone else will be asked to ring his cell, and... Holy. Shit. His cell. In the confusion and panic this morning, I've totally forgotten about it. I jump up and almost get flung off the moving buggy. Ma and second aunt yelp and catch hold of me, and the buggy halts suddenly, throwing us back in our seats. What happened, the driver says. You okay? Did you drop something? I can only shake my head and wave a weak hand at him, indicating that he should continue. Once I catch my breath, I say, key to looper handphone nia dear. Handphone siapa oh, ma gasps, her hand flying to cover her mouth. Ada dim and a handphone nia? I don't know where it is. I shake my head. Pasti didalam kanting salana, second aunt says. His pants pocket. Yeah, that's a fair assumption to make, and I only checked one. How loud is its ringtone? Would people be able to hear it ringing inside the cooler? They will probably start calling him soon, if they haven't already been calling. Here we are, the driver says, as the buggy stops at the entrance to the resort. We clamber out and then stop and stare at the grand entrance. The lobby of the hotel is built atop a hill. The words majestic and hallowed come to mind. The resort has been designed with ancient Southeast Asian architecture in mind, with richly carved ornaments decorating the giant columns. The lobby is open on two sides, 
offering a stunning view of the resort and the ocean below. The ceiling is so high I have to tilt my head all the way back to see the top, and surrounding the lobby is a peaceful pond with brilliant orange koi and floating candles. Despite the gorgeous setting, my chest is tight, my stomach knotted painfully. Ma, big aunt, and second aunt all wear the same strained expression. We're greeted by a receptionist, who tries to tell us where each of us needs to go, but big aunt interrupts her. No, they must come with me first, big aunt says. The receptionist falters. Um, but the rooms are in the opposite direction of the kitchen. It's a big resort. Hair and makeup is expected at the bridal suite soon. If you go to the kitchen first, you might be late. Is okay, we be very fast, Big Aunt says, rising to full authoritative mode. But the harried receptionist spots someone and her whole demeanor changes, angling her face in a sweet way and smiling and fluttering her lashes. There's the owner. He'll be able to help with your request. The owner? For a second, my family and I freeze, making panicky looks at each other. Hi, Janine, everything going okay, a smooth, rich voice that can only be described as molten chocolate says. Morning, sir, Janine says. I was just telling the wedding vendors where to go. She bats her lashes at him again. My family turns around and introduces themselves to him, but I'm frozen to the spot. Because even without turning around, I know who it is. I hear his voice in my dreams. I can still feel his touch on me, his strong, gentle hands on my skin. And you must be the photographer, he asks. Taking a deep breath to try to steady myself, I turn around to face him. The one that got away. The one who took a huge chunk of my heart, my soul, with him. His smile freezes on his face, and I see years of history fly through his mind as I say in a hoarse voice, I am. Hi, Nathan. It's been a while. Part 2 Black Diamond Girl Finds Boy Under Very Awkward Circumstances 12 The years have been kind to Nathan. He's obviously started working out. Even in his button-down shirt with the sleeves rolled up to his elbows, I can see his biceps straining against the fabric. His face has lost its teenage softness, giving way to a defined jawline that makes my teeth clench because fuck, he's hot. So much hotter than I remember, and I remember him as the most gorgeous boy I'd ever laid eyes on in real life. My gaze skitters to his hands. No wedding band. Part of me a very small part squeals inwardly. His expression is a mystery surprised, obviously, but also a whole host of other emotions that I can't quite read. Is he happy to see me? Horrified. Maybe both. Medi he says, and his voice is deeper, but still achingly familiar. I'm momentarily distracted by my family's half-whispered discussion. Seaton. Second aunt is saying. Ghost. SSH, Big Aunt scolds her. I too Seaton. It Onania, Khan. Second Aunt hisses. Is everything okay, ladies? Nathan says. You the owner of this hotel? Ma says. Mr. Jake, is it? No, Ma, this is. I'm Nathan. It's so nice to finally meet all of you. Shit, my family's going to be like, finally. What you mean, finally? We just need to go to the kitchen real quick, I say. Just gotta check on the cake. It's the centerpiece, you know. Gotta make sure it's perfect, okay, see you, bye. I'll take you. He touches me lightly on the back and just that small touch is enough to send an electric current racing down all the way to my feet. You must have a thousand things to take care of. I can spare the time. 
with my mom and aunts following behind and whispering among themselves, Nathan leads me through a side door marked staff, and we walk along what seems to be an endless maze of hallways. How have you been, he says, glancing at me from the corner of his eye. Good. You? It looks like your family business has really taken off. I bet you take the most amazing pictures. He gives me an inscrutable smile. It sure has. Don't leave your big day to chance, leave it to the chance. I laugh weakly. My stomach is not doing great. He bites back a grin. Did you come up with that slogan? Obviously. And you've done well yourself. My God, Nathan. You're the owner of this place. Well, part owner, he says, with a dimpled smile. There are many investors involved. But you're running it? Yeah. Pride surges through me. This has always been a dream of his, for as long as I've known him. He's always wanted to work in the hospitality industry, run his own hotel, and he's definitely achieved that with the Iona Lucia. Nathan, wow. Excuse, excuse, Ma says, coming in between us. How you two know each other? Hi, I'm Medis' mother. You call me Auntie Natasha, okay. Nathan stops walking to give Ma a firm handshake, looking her in the eye as he says, Hi, Mrs. Chen I mean, Auntie. I'm Nathan. I was Medis. Friend from college, I blurt out. Everyone stares at me. It's clear that neither of my aunts nor my mother is buying the lie. College friend, Nathan says, and then gives me a forced smile I can actually read. One that spells disappointment. It's not you, I want to shout at him. It's me, and my mother, and my aunts, and the fact that we're on our way to go look for the corpse of some dude I killed last night who was supposed to be you, apparently. But I can't tell him any of it so we walk the rest of the way in painful silence. I nearly breathe an audible sigh of relief when we finally go through a set of double doors and find ourselves in a bustling kitchen. Nearly there. The cooler must be around here somewhere. Nathan leads us past the busy chefs and chef underlings, all of them chopping and searing and stirring. They each glance up and greet Nathan as we walk by, and he greets them with an easy smile here a pat on the back there. He was always effortlessly charming when I knew him back in college, but now he's even more so. It's obvious that everyone in here, from the head chef Miguel down to the dishwasher Ming, knows and adores him. This is your workstation, he says to Big Aunt, as we approach a workstation. Xiaoling is already there, dozens of fondant flowers spread out in front of her. She jumps to attention, grinning widely at Big Aunt. Morning, chef, she chirps, and then her eyes widen when she sees the rest of us. Oh, hi, aunties. Hey, Medi. Wasn't expecting to see you down here. Xiaoling, Big Aunt says, her voice terse. Where are coolers? Oh. Well, I thought I'd get an early start, do a bit extra, you know. I wanted to surprise you. Coolers. Big Aunt snaps, and we all jump, even Nathan. Big Aunt just has that kind of effect on everyone. Fridge. Xiaoling cries, hurrying toward a big steel door. Is something wrong? Did I do something? I just wanted to help. No, you very good helper, Big Aunt says, forcing a smile. You stay there and finish the flowers, okay, good job. I'm about to go into the walk-in fridge with my family when Nathan takes my arm. Can we talk, he says. Not right now. I need to help out with the um, the cakes. His thick eyebrows come together in confusion, and he gazes down at me from under his thick lashes. I swear, this man and his lashes. You're the photographer, right? Why would you need to help out with the cakes? For the photos, obviously. 
Yeah, that's it. I'm taking photos of the wedding prep. You know how it is nowadays. People want to know everything there is to know about weddings, down to the prep work. Do they? Okay. He sighs. Maybe later. I don't know what your schedule's like. I'm guessing it's pretty hectic, but if we could. I struggle to keep the smile on my face when Ma pops into view from the square window in the steel door, mouthing at me to hurry up and get inside. Yeah. Totally, yeah, we'll talk later. Okay. Okay. I turn to leave, but Nathan catches my hand, giving it a squeeze. It's good seeing you again, Medi, he says, quietly, and the sincerity in his voice almost makes me burst into tears. When he turns and walks away, I'm whisked right back to when we broke up all those years ago, when I'd forced myself to stay in my room and do nothing as he left, heartbroken. All sorts of emotions well up inside me, and I have to fight back the sob that's threatening to rise out of me. I watch him leave, struggling to get my breath under control, and then walk into the fridge. Lock the door. Big aunt commands in Indonesian as soon as I get inside. I do as she says, wondering what we're going to say when someone needs to fetch some ingredient from here. The fridge is large and well stocked with crates of vegetables and fruit and other assorted ingredients, including crate upon crate of wine bottles. There is a separate section for meats behind a plastic curtain. My aunts and mom have located the right cooler and pulled it out from the shelves and into the meat section so it's not visible from outside the fridge. Okay, big aunt says. Booker. You open it. It's your cooler, second aunt says. Normally, I'd stand back and let them fight it out, because you don't ever get in between a tiff between big aunt and second aunt. But running into Nathan has rattled me. I feel untethered, wild. Without a word, I reach for the cooler and lift the lid up. I see what's inside the cooler, and I scream. 13. It's chaos. Big Aunt sees the contents of the cooler and immediately understands. Second Aunt and Ma, blocked from view by me and Big Aunt, flap around us, yelling in such rapid Indonesian that I beg them to stop and switch to English before my head explodes trying to make sense of anything. Meanwhile, Big Aunt is just standing there, eyes wide, rattled for the first time I can remember seeing in my life. Everything we've piled on top of Jake last night the blankets, the baking supplies are still inside, but instead of a neat pile hiding his body, they are now a mess, packs of flour open, white powder, and colorful sprinkles all over and Jake. I have to look away before I lose my shit. Because Jake oh god, Jake. He not dead last night, Big Aunt says, her voice coming out all dazed. When we put him inside cooler, he's still alive. What? Ma and second aunt yelp. Ma pushes me aside and takes a look at Jake his face now uncovered in what must have been his struggle to try and get out of the cooler, and she shouts too. But what she actually says is, Yeah, That my lily guy. All noise ceases, sucking the entire walk-in fridge into silence. As one, we all stare at Ma, who's staring at Jake. Jake, who's in a very different position than what we left him in last night. Jake, whose mouth is frozen open in what must have been a cry for help. Jake, who is being prodded in the head by a carrot-wielding Ma. Ma! What are you doing? I just check to see maybe he's sleeping, maybe we can wake him up. Hey, our guan, chi lai ah, she says. Shawo, chan a yi. She pokes his cheek again with the pointy end of the carrot but gets no response. Adu, he really dead this time. Whoa, this so bad. So bad. My eyes fill with tears. It's too much, all of it. He was awful, but even he didn't deserve such a horrible death. Ma, I'm so sore. Who am I going to get my lilies from now? 
I stop mid-sentence and stare at her. We all do. Why you all just stand like statues? This is big problem. Lily very expensive, you know. Aguan, he give me best price, and she freezes, a look of horror on her face. Maybe she's just realized how ridiculous she's being right now. Aduru. He's supposed to bring in one last batch of Lily for wedding. I guess not. Now my arrangements all will be lopsided. Adu, Jamana Waye. How? How? She flaps around at us. Breathe, I tell myself. Fortunately, Ma's little meltdown seems to have had a calming effect on Big Aunt, who straightens up and brushes her hands down her front like she's cleaning invisible crumbs off herself. Okay, San Mai, she says. Hey! She clicks her fingers sharply, and Ma stops flapping. Stop that, she scolds gently. Is okay. You no need Lily, your arrangements still be very pretty. Ma smiles and gives an A.W., shucks, face. I mean, really now, the woman and her priorities. So this boy not Jake? Big Aunt says. Ma shakes her head. This is Aguan, my lily supplier. Remember he brought mangoes from Indo for me. I think his English name is. Timothy? Tommy? Something like that. But Ma, how I don't understand, I say. You said you met him online. How come I don't even know where to begin? Did you tell Jake I mean, are gone about going online to find me a date? Of course I tell him. I tell all my suppliers. Aguan, Lin my auntie, Yi my auntie, Rong Na uncle, they all know. I always tell them my daughter, she's so pretty and kind, but she's still single, adu, how she refused to give me grandchildren. Every time I got good boy to ask her out, she say she don't want to. You not remember? I try to set you up with Aguan but you keep saying no, give me this reason, that reason. Aguan ask why. I say I don't know. But my daughter is torturing me, she never wants to go out with boy. Okay, so you've been telling everyone about my dating life, I say, through gritted teeth. Lack of dating life, second aunt says, helpfully, from the far corner of the room where she's yet again doing Tai Kai draw big watermelon, she says under her breath, swinging her arms out and up, and then cut in half. I ignore her. And what did Aguan say to you? Whoa, he's so helpful there, Ma says, smiling and nodding. He tell me is okay if you don't want to get set up with him. He say I should make you go on internet find boyfriend. I say, adu, Mehdi will not want to do that. He say it's okay, got very good website for young people. He show me dating website and say, why not create a profile for you? then easier to persuade you to use it. My mind spins. So he knew you were using it and pretending to be me? Of course not, you so silly. I keep asking you to use dating website, but you don't want to, so finally I use it for you. I don't tell Aguan. I just use it, and then what? Hotel owner message me, and so kind, make such good macho. There it is, finally. Realization dawns on her face. Even second aunt pauses her tai chi movement to watch as mama mentally digests what she's just told us. Her face scrunches up like a ball of tissue, and her mouth drops open in an enraged wail. He tricked me. Use me get to my daughter. Big aunt nods solemnly. I hear about this kind of internet scam before is called goldfish. Catfish, I say. No, I'm sure is called goldfish. Because pretend got gold, but actually just a fish. I know better than to argue with her. Second aunt snorts from where she's wobbling on one leg. What is it? Big aunt snaps. 
Nothing, second aunt says, raising her other leg slowly. Big aunt turns back to face us. Anyway. It's just so typical, second aunt says. Because you always know best, right, Diagia. Diagia always correct. Who decide to put this Aguan boy in cooler? Is you. We just follow blind, don't ask questions. Now turn out Aguan not dead, but we kill him by putting him inside cooler. She pushes her palms out in front of her slowly, moving her feet in a gentle circle. Big Aunt takes a deep breath. Anyway. Now you're going to tell us again what to do, even though so obvious you don't know also. Big Aunt rounds on her. And you do, is it? If you know what to do, then you say la. Don't stand in corner doing tai chi, come tell us solution. Second aunt pointedly ignores her and continues moving her palms round. I'm sure big aunt is about to explode when her cell phone rings. She picks it up, still glaring at second aunt, and speaks in rapid Mandarin. Saimai, you're here already? Okay, good. Yes, I know it's very early, but we have a problem. Come meet us at the kitchen. Just ask them take you down here. Now, yes. She hangs up. Fourth aunt is here. I don't know why, but it makes me feel better to know that the whole family is here, even though realistically I know it doesn't make much of a difference. We need to decide what we're going to do, I say quickly, before big aunt and second aunt can get into it again. Now that we know Jake isn't Jake, and the real Jake Nathan is still alive, that means the wedding is definitely going to go on as planned. Which means, like it or not, we've got to show up and do our jobs and pretend that everything's okay. They're all looking at me funny, and it takes a second to realize that I've just taken on a leadership role with MYAUNTS. Whoa. I quail under their gazes. Um, sorry, that was just a suggestion, I didn't mean to. No, you are right, Medi, Ma says, smiling fondly. Big aunt nods. You right. The wedding continue on. We must get rid of body before guests come. If we leave body here, only matter of time before someone find. Okay, we think of plan. Sekaran Jambarapa. I glance at my phone. Quarter to nine. I have to do hair and makeup for bride and mother and bridesmaids, second aunt says. Eh yeah. My other flower suppliers all coming soon also, Ma says. And I need to finish up welcome cakes, big aunt says. Medi, what time you start photos? I just need to be there to take photos when the bride's makeup is nearly done, so I have time right now. I can take the cooler out and, um get it onto a yacht and take it back to the mainland. I'll drive it back to your bakery. Okay, good, very good. Big Aunt takes out the key to her bakery and hands it to me. He quite heavy you know. You take Saimai with you. I nod. Normally, I would hate to be such a bother to others, but I have enough self-realization to know I would struggle to carry Jake's dammit, a guan's body out of the cooler and into Big Aunt's fridge. I'll need all the help I can get. As though thinking a fourth aunt has summoned her, there's a knock on the fridge door, and I look through the plastic curtains to see fourth aunt's face peeping through the window. She waves at me, and I go to unlock the door and usher her through the plastic curtains. Why is everyone gathered inside the fridge, she says, then she sees the open cooler with a guan's body in it. Why's that thing here? Wasn't he supposed to be at the bakery? She looks closely at him interest peaked. Ha! Huh. He's not bad looking. Sometimes I think that Ma and Fourth Aunt are always at odds with each other because they're just too similar. Priorities neither one has them. Big Aunt quickly fills Fourth Aunt in on what's happened in our plan, and Fourth Aunt groans when she's told she and I need to go back to the mainland to stash the body in the fridge. I just got my nails done, 
she moans, showing us her nails, which have been blinged out with crystals and, on her pinkies, even feathers. Ma cringes. Who do you nails like that? How do you wash your bum when you have feather on your nails? Ma says. Very carefully, not that it's any of your business how I wash myself. Ma wrinkles her nose and flaps a hand over it. So unhygienic. So not practical. You won't be able to cook, bathe, clean. I can do all of those things. I'm about to help your kid clean up her mess, aren't I? Ma turns red, and I wince. The lowest, most painful blows my mother and her sisters strike with is me and my cousins. That's how you know that Ma and her sisters are truly fighting they talk shit about each other's kids. I hate that I've become a liability for Ma, that from now on, this will forever be dredged up as a trump card against her. My nails may be impractical, but at least I didn't kill someone like your daughter did. We are happy helping, Big Aunt says, giving forth Aunt a look. Is what family do. Now go, quick. We lose so much time already. Nodding, I replace the blanket on top of Oguan and close the cooler before grabbing the handle and pulling. It's heavy, but it rolls easily enough on all four wheels. The handle feels a bit shaky, and I wonder if it's built to carry the weight of a full-grown human male. I'll have to be very careful with it. Big Aunt walks out of the fridge first, and then Second Aunt and Ma hold open the swing doors for me as I pull the cooler along behind me, followed by Fourth Aunt, who frowns at her nails as she walks. Big Aunt looks as imperious as ever, not a hint of guilt anywhere about her. Xiaoling, who's busy putting gold luster dust on the decorative flowers, looks up at the procession. The flowers are almost done, chef. She spots the cooler and comes toward me, saying, let me help you with that. The back will catch us sometimes. No, Big Aunt barks, and Xiaoling shrinks back, her eyes wide. I feel awful for her. All she's done is try to be helpful. You doing more important things, Big Aunt says. Must finish the flowers before guests arrive. Kuai Yi Dian. She claps and Xiaoling positively jumps to attention, scrambling to finish painting the flowers. I mouth a thank you to Big Aunt and continue walking through the kitchen, trying my best to look like I'm not pulling a cooler full of dead dude behind me. Second Aunt, Ma and fourth aunt walk ahead, which is good, as any and all attention is immediately attracted to them instead of me. With fourth aunt's flamboyant clothes she's wearing a flamingo pink sequin top and bright turquoise pants it's impossible to take your eyes off her. In contrast, I'm in my don't look at me, I'm the help all black photographer's outfit. With any luck, everyone will assume I'm hotel staff all the way back to the yacht. Fortunately, the kitchen staff is just as busy as before. No one gives us a second glance, everyone is too occupied with chopping and frying. We make it out of the kitchen without getting asked any questions and breathe a sigh of relief. Out in the quiet hallway, our footsteps and the clack-clack of the cooler's wheels seem deafening. Mama glances back at me and says, Mehdi, you don't pull like that, you pull like this. She stops, adjusting my posture so I'm standing straight up. No slouch, that is bad posture, later you will hurt your back. Actually, second aunt says, I learn from Tai Chi Quan this is best posture. She comes close to me and readjusts my posture, muttering, knees bend a bit, yes. Between her and Ma's adjustments, I'm now standing awkwardly, slightly leaning forward, knees bent arms all weird and stiff. Aya, no, Ma says. I've been taking ballroom dance. I know good posture. Chin up, Mehdi. No offense, but I don't think that right now is the best time to give Mehdi posture adjustments, fourth aunt says. I nod gratefully. Fourth aunt is right. 
Ma's expression looks like I might as well have punched her right in the heart. But thank you for your help, Ma and second aunt. You're both right, my back was starting to hurt. Ma and second aunt smile smugly and thank God resume walking. We walk the rest of the way to the lobby in relative silence, save for Ma muttering to herself, Aya, no more cheap lily. The lobby is a lot busier than when we first arrived. Ma's underlings have arrived, wearing their trademark bright red and gold shirts, the colors of good fortune in Chinese culture. With an excited squeal, Ma rushes over to survey the arrangements. She's been working on these for weeks, designing each centerpiece and flower stand, overseeing the workmanship meticulously. Now, she beams with naked pride as the crates are opened and her workers take out the most elaborate flower sculptures and arrangements I have ever seen. She barks out orders this tower to the ballroom, that vast to the bridal room and is about to scurry off, giving out more orders, when she stops and turns back to me. Medi, oh I forget about the you know what she says, but I wave her away. It's fine, Ma. I've got everything under control. Okay. Okay, you be careful, YA. She squeezes my arm and then is off, shouting to a worker to be careful with the peonies. My phone beeps with a text message. Seb, 9.51am, I'm here. Super early, but that's what you get from the world's best second photog. Medi, 9.52am, great. Go to the groom's suite and start taking photos. Seb, 9.53am, I, a boss. A hotel receptionist hurries toward us. Excuse me, sorry, are you the hair and makeup artist? Second aunt nods. Oh good, I've got instructions to take you to the bridal suite. Please follow me. Second aunt glances at me, her eyes questioning. You going to be okay or not? I smile at her. Go. I'll be fine. Okay, auntie go first then. You be careful. With that, she leaves, and I'm alone with fourth aunt. And the body. You doing okay, fourth aunt? I can't even begin to describe how bad I feel about dragging her into this. I'm the least close to fourth aunt out of all my aunts. Maybe it's because of her ongoing feud with Ma, or maybe it's because she's the opposite of me in every way. Whatever it is, I've always felt a little awkward around her, and now we're supposed to go all the way back to San Gabriel Valley with a dead body. This is Fiyin. I am totally okay with this plan. It's way too early for me to be awake. Fourth aunt sighs. I'm going to look so haggard at tonight's performance. You? Haggard? Never. I pull the cooler up again and resume walking. You're looking great, auntie. Very glamour oh. Outside the lobby, the long, winding path leading back to the pier is made of loose pebbles. My stomach drops. How the hell am I going to wheel the cooler down this path? Why would anyone make a path out of pebbles? This is a serious design flaw. What about people in wheelchairs, or parents with strollers, or people carrying dead bodies in giant coolers? Would you like me to call you a buggy, miss, a hotel receptionist asks. I startle, and the receptionist tilts his head at the cooler. Let me call you a buggy. Nope. No need. He frowns, confused. But. I get buggy sickness, fourth aunt says. We'll be fine. This old thing is empty anyway. We smile widely at the receptionist until he goes away, looking bemused. Now what? I whisper to fourth aunt. Put those biceps to good use, she replies, pushing the end of the cooler. It rolls off the smooth marble and onto the pebble path. We wince at the horrible crunching noise it makes as I pull, and fourth aunt pushes it along the path. 
This is not working, I grunt, after only a few seconds. People are going to wonder why we're not putting it on a buggy. Sure enough, when I glance back, people are taking notice, throwing strange looks our way. But that might also just be the effect that fourth aunt often has, being the equivalent of a human peacock. Pull harder, she gasps, shoving at the cooler. It makes more of a crunching noise and barely moves an inch. We're gonna have to carry it. Fourth aunt doesn't look happy, but as we've got no choice, I take the front of the cooler and lift, and she does the same with the back. Together, we heave the cooler up and stagger slowly down the pebble path. It's a long journey, but with every painful step, the resort is getting farther from view. Until fourth aunt suddenly stops, her eyes going wide. What's going my words die in my mouth when I turn around, because there's a buggy headed toward us, and incidentally, it's occupied by Nathan and an elderly couple I quickly recognize as Tom Cruise Satopo's parents, that is, the parents of the groom, aka the billionaires who are footing the staggering bill for this wedding. Nathan's entire face lights up when he notices me, which does funny things to my stomach. My poor stomach it can't decide whether to not out of sheer terror due to body in cooler, etc., or flutter with pleasure because Nathan, etc. It compromises by giving a nauseated gurgle. Nathan hops out of his buggy and says to Mr. and Mrs. Satopo, here's someone I'd love you to meet. I swallow, my mouth dry. The old couple smile politely, obviously as confused as I am because I'm a nobody. But when they see fourth aunt, they actually gasp out loud and grab each other's hands. This is Mimi Chan. Mr. Satopo positively squeals. Mrs. Satopo shakes her head in wonder, mouth agape. Is it really her? Fourth aunt takes this in stride. She lowers her end of the cooler gracefully before sashaying to them. Nathan helps the older couple down from the buggy. They still can't take their eyes off fourth aunt, even as they clamber down. We're such big fans, Mrs. Satopo says. Her English is flawless, her accent slightly British. Belatedly, I recall googling her and reading that she met her husband while they were both studying at Oxford. We've followed your career ever since you were a little girl. Oh, that's so sweet to hear. I love meeting my fans. Fourth aunt gives them a big hug, and they practically melt into her, their faces beaming hard. You know, our son Tom booked your family's services for today because he knows we're your number one fans, Mr. Satopo says. Fourth aunt's grin is as wide as a Cheshire cat's. We'll definitely be hearing more about this later, when Ma's around to listen to fourth aunt boast about how she's brought in good business for us. And I will have to nod and tell them that it's true. Ma's not going to like that. But where are you two off to? Mrs. Satopo says. You're going the wrong way. The hotel's that way. Oh, we just need to. My brain short circuits. We just need to what? I almost tell them that we've brought the wrong cooler, but quickly realize that I would be admitting a mistake to our clients. Big Aunt would have my head for it. No, I can't tell them that. We didn't want to take up too much room inside the walk-in fridge, so we're just taking this cooler back real quick. Back? You mean back to the mainland? Mr. Satopo says. That's a whole lot of hassle just to stow a cooler, his wife says. Nathan, dear, there must be a place for them to store it here. You can't possibly have these lovely ladies traipsing all across your island and across the water on such a big day. Of course, Nathan says. I'm as surprised as you are. He turns to me and says, you can store it in the walk-in fridge. It's plenty big enough. I really don't want to trouble you. It's no trouble, really. Nathan, dear, why don't you help the lovely girl take the cooler back to the fridge? We'll be all right here with Mimi. You take the buggy. We'll walk, Mrs. Satopo says. 
She turns to fourth aunt and wins her arm through hers before saying, Come, we must take so many pictures together. Oh my goodness, you are even prettier in real life. I watch in dismay as the Sutopos and fourth aunt walk away. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to let them walk to the hotel. It's pretty far, and it's uphill. I agree, Nathan says, easily. We'll leave the buggy here for them, and I'll help move this cooler back to the kitchen. No, it's okay, don't bother, you must be so busy. He pauses, giving me that smile of his. Even after all these years, it still looks so disarmingly boyish on his rugged features, instantly taking years off and making him look all of five years old. It's going to be a crazy weekend, isn't it? You have no idea, I want to say. Tell you a secret. He lowers his voice and moves closer to me. My heart thumps painfully. I may be pissing my pants a little at the thought of everything that needs to go well this weekend. Just a little. It's a huge deal for us, and I just opening this hotel was my dream. My investors are pretty nervous at the expense. I really need this wedding to go perfectly. I gnaw on my lip. Perfectly. Right. Which probably means no corpses being found on the premises. Nathan rakes a hand through his hair and grimaces. Sorry, I didn't mean to spill everything. It's just he smiles at me. Seeing you, it's amazing, Medi, and so unexpected. I mean, seriously, what are the odds? I'm so glad you're here. You've always got your feet firmly on the ground, and it's great to see you. It has been amazing, I say, meaning every word. And I'm so glad to see how well you're doing. I mean, you opened your own hotel at 26, Nathan. That's incredible. He shrugs, blushing. I had a lot of help. Met the right people at JLL, got seed money from my folks, got to know lots of investors. I didn't do all this by myself. I just got really, really lucky. Well, I'm sure you also worked your ass off. A bit, he laughs, and it's exactly like the old times, as though we've picked up right where we left off. We meet each other's eyes, and all of our beautiful history unravels in my mind's eye. I remember every single detail every kiss, the exact way his eyelashes feel against my face, the solid warmth of his hands with aching clarity. So, um, are you seeing anyone? My heart stutters, and I shake my head furiously. You? My family has been setting me up with various blind dates, but nothing has stuck. Oh God. I can feel my cheeks burning, because speaking of blind dates, mine's in the cooler right next to him. As though reading my mind, he picks up the cooler handle and pulls, frowning when it doesn't budge. It's impossible to move it on this pebble path, I babble. Look, don't worry about me, you're slammed with work, and like you said, you've got investors up your ass. Just go, I'll call for a bellboy or something. His frown deepens. Let me do this for you, he says in a gruff voice, giving the cooler a hard yank. The top of the cooler pops up a couple of inches for one heart-stopping moment before I push it back down. Jesus. I could pass out right now, I really could. Nathan looks down at the cooler and cocks his head to one side. Is that? Oh God. It is. It's a corner of Big Aunt's blanket sticking out like a fucking woolen tongue. I watch as Nathan moves in slow motion and reaches down to open the cooler. And I do the only thing I can, the thing I've been dreaming of doing for the last four years. I grab his broad shoulders, feeling his muscles under my fingers, and pull him back to face me. Medi. I don't wait for him to finish speaking. I reach up, still pulling him down, and let our mouths meet in a fervent kiss. 14. The kiss sears through my skin, singeing my flesh, reaching deep into my memories, 
reminding me of the heat of our romance. In the space of a few seconds, I taste those college days once more the Diddy Reese cookies we used to share with Selena at 11pm on a Tuesday, the scent of hookah smoke as we walked down Broxton Avenue holding hands, the feel of his hand cupped firmly round my waist, sending hot waves running through my entire body. The way he made me laugh, a full-on, no-holds-barred belly laugh, and then how he'd climb on top of me and kiss me fully, with his entire being, his skin against mine. By the time we break apart we're both breathless. I look at his face, and I know his thinking of our Uckler days as well. Medi, he whispers, leaning in again, catching my mouth with his. So soft, and warm. New and yet achingly familiar. God, how I've missed you. I've missed you too. My voice catches with emotion. I have. So much. He takes both of my hands in his, gazing down at me with his beautiful eyes. I've been wanting to kiss you since I saw you this morning. He sighs. Ever since Ukla, I've wondered what happened with us. I've always wanted to reach out to you, but I wasn't sure if you wanted to talk to me I mean, what happened back then? My stomach twists. It's hard to explain. I know. I got the feeling, especially when I found out you never told your mom about us. I cringe. It must have been quite a blow to discover that your girlfriend of three years never told her family about you. And for him to find out today, of all days. I am such a shit. I'm sorry, I it's complicated. The dimples appear again. I get it. Families often are. Honestly, I thought I'd be more upset about it, but seeing you after all these years. Relief surges through my chest. He's not upset about it. God, how is he this amazing? I know. I. Hey, someone shouts from afar. We break apart as if we're guilty teenagers. A middle-aged man with the world's bushiest mustache is climbing up the hill toward the resort. Halfway up, he pauses for breath, fanning himself with a piece of paper. When he finally gets to us, his face is tomato red. You he gasps. Hi, Sheriff, Nathan says. Can I help you with something? Sheriff. I freeze. My insides have turned to stone. You can't can't do this here, the sheriff says. Do what? The sheriff straightens up, still catching his breath. This large brouhaha the hotel is holding. Do you have the right permit for it? I doubt you do, because I sure as hell didn't sign one. And there's a storm coming, supposed to hit us later today. I don't think you should let this party go on. Despite the weirdness of the situation, Nathan seems completely at ease. Come on, Sheriff McConnell. It's a wedding, and I've got permits from the mainland to hold large functions here. It's all legit. I'll have someone come by and show you the papers. And yes, we're prepared for the storm if it does hit us. We'll get everyone inside. It'll all be okay. Mainland, the sheriff spits. You mainland people think you're better than the rest of us. I'll be back, just you wait. You and your mainland permits. He strides away, muttering angrily to himself. I release my breath. Nathan must have noticed how pale I look because he says, Are you okay? I'm about to reply when fourth aunt calls out, Oh, you kids are still here. Done with the pictures? Nathan says, cheerily. Yep. Fourth aunt whispers to Nathan when she reaches us, I think Mr. Satopo is pretty tired. Might wanna get him to his room now. Nathan nods and hurries back to where Mr. and Mrs. Satopo are standing. Halfway there, he pauses and says, I'll call a buggy down for you. That cooler's heavy. Don't worry about us, I babble, we'll be fine. You go. Nathan nods at me and gives me one last smile before going. 
we stand there, waving at them as they drive away. I turn to see fourth aunt smiling slyly at me. Um. Everything okay? I don't know, you tell me, she says. I have no idea what you're talking about. She nudges me playfully with her elbow. I saw that kiss. My breath comes out in a heavy whoosh. Damn it. The last thing I need is one of my aunts finding out about my love life. Please don't tell the others. Fourth aunt grins. You have my word. Aho, uh -oh, I do so love knowing something your mother doesn't. She doesn't know about this, right? I shake my head. Anyway, we need to focus on this. I nod at the cooler. What do we do with it? I give up trying to carry that thing all the way down to the pier, fourth aunt says. She wiggles her fingers at me. I'll ruin my nails. Yeah, I don't think we can carry it that far either. Let's take it back to the fridge, and we can all carry it down together when the others are free. That'll be more manageable. Okay. We struggle to push the cooler off the path, but once it's back on the smooth marble floor, it's pretty easy to wheel it all the way back to the kitchen. Big Aunt's face lights up when she sees us, then falls when she spots the cooler behind us. What happened? Why that thing back here again? I tell her about the pebble path and the impossibility of wheeling the cooler on it, and she sighs, leading the way to the walk-in fridge. Push it there, she says, pointing to a corner. I do as I'm told and then we put containers of pastries on top of the cooler. Maybe is okay there for now. We survey the cooler. It looks so exposed here, in a place where people are constantly coming in and out. Just as I think that, one of the hotel chefs comes in, pausing when he sees us. Essential personnel only, he says. They with me, Big Aunt says coolly, and he frowns but doesn't say anything else. He grabs a crate of vegetables and leaves the fridge. We should get out of here, I say. It's obvious we don't belong here. Not me in my photographer's outfit and fourth aunt in her sequin flamingo outfit. You know worry, I keep eyes on cooler, big aunt says, as we walk out of the fridge. I really need to go do the bridal photos now, but once we have free time, we should meet here and move the cooler out. The three of us nod, Big Aunt says she'll let Ma know of the plan, and I rush off to the bridal suite to update Second Aunt. And do my job. The bride, Jacqueline, is radiant even before Second Aunt finishes doing her makeup. Her skin has the kind of glow that only years of meticulous, expensive skincare can achieve, and her nose has the perfect arch and slight upturn that only the best surgeon can give. She catches me staring at it and says with a wink, Souvenir from Seoul. I like her immediately. After the round of introductions I've obviously met the bride beforehand, but there are many new faces here, including her mom and what seems like 1200 bridesmaids who are all wearing bathrobes and walking in and out, sipping flutes of champagne. The bridal suite is huge, easily bigger than my and Ma's house, with two bedrooms, a gorgeously decorated living room, and a dining room with a large chandelier. It's also a mess, every available surface has been covered by a carelessly flung dress, or heels, or handbags, or mascara, or champagne glasses. A waiter swans around with trays of champagne and chocolate-covered strawberries. Second aunt has set up a makeup station near the window for the best possible lighting. Next to her, her two assistants have their own workstations and are busily dabbing at bridesmaids' faces. I take out my trusty Canon and fit my favorite lens on it a fixed 50mm f1.2. I bought it for myself as a Christmas present last year, and it's worth every goddamn cent. The pictures come out lush, the focus crisp and the background melting into a delicious blur. I usually have to settle for the 35mm when shooting inside hotel rooms because I need the wider angle to take everything in but this suite is so huge that I can easily fit everything in with the 50 millimeters, heaven. Can I take photos of the wedding gown, please? I say to Jacqueline. Of course. 
Miss Helene here will help you. She's the best maid of honor. Jacqueline grins up at a tall, slender bridesmaid, who rolls her eyes. She only says that to butter me up. I'm Maureen. Nice to meet you, Maureen says, with a wry smile. Yes, but it works so well, Jacqueline laughs. Only because I love you, you brat. Maureen turns to me. Come, I'll help you with the dress. It's a two-person job. She's not kidding. The dress is huge, and it takes the two of us to pull it off the mannequin and hang it up against the floor-to-ceiling window. The sunlight at its back makes it almost translucent, and every lace detail shines through. I was expecting a Vera Wang or an Alexander McQueen, but the silk label says Bayan, which is a nice surprise. An Indonesian designer. It makes me like Jacqueline even more. It strikes me, as I take pictures of the dress from various angles, that this is the first time I'm photographing a wedding dress by an Indonesian designer, and it feels special somehow. It rekindles the love I have for photography and why I decided to join my family's venture in the first place. If only wedding photography could be all about the intimate details just me, my camera, pretty dresses, and happy couples, instead of the family obligation and drama that come with it. But now is so not the time to think about leaving the family business. I take photos of all the other details, the bride's red-soled lubbertins, which will no doubt kill her feet, the luscious bridal bouquet Ma has created, the invitations. Tant Johanna, I say to the bride's mother. Tant means auntie in Indonesian I can never bring myself to call my elders just by their first name. Can I take photos of the jewellery, please? In Chinese weddings, the bride's jewellery is the last to go on, and is usually a gift from her parents. I've taken dozens of pictures of parents putting diamond necklaces on their daughters, and without fail, it's always a bittersweet moment, full of tearful smiles. Tante Johanna smiles and ushers me into the bedroom. She takes out a velvet box from the safe and opens it. What do you think? It's a gorgeous set earrings, necklace, and a bracelet, all of them dripping with diamonds, arranged in a floral design. The smallest diamond in the set looks about one carat, the biggest easily over three. I'm looking at a set that must have cost them over a million dollars. It's beautiful, I tell her and she beams. It was designed by an Indonesian jeweler, you know, she says, with obvious pride. I have her stay right there in the room as I take pictures of the jewellery. I never let myself be left alone with anything expensive, just in case that thing goes missing and I get blamed for it. When I'm done with the jewellery, I slide the box back to Tante Johanna open, so she can see that everything is still intact, and she smiles and returns it to the safe. I'm about to go back out to the living room when my phone boops with a text. Seb, 10.18 a.m., SOS. Medi, 10.18 a.m., what's wrong? Seb, 10.19 a.m., men. A picture appears on my screen. I stare at the phone in disbelief. Seb is in the groom's suite, which is down the corridor from the bridal suite and looks identical. Except instead of bridesmaids swanning around, chatting and laughing, the groomsmen are lying dead drunk on every available surface. Seb sends another picture, and I groan out loud. The groom, Tom Crusatopo, is lying half-naked in the large, clawfoot bathtub. Medi, 10.21 a.m., why are men? Seb, 10.21 a.m., tell me about it. I've been trying to wake them for the last 15 minutes. Medi, 10.22 a.m., where's the WP? Seb, 10.23 a.m., I don't know, I don't keep track of the wedding planner. They're supposed to be keeping track of things like this. I swear under my breath. Medi, 10.24 a.m., I'll be right there. I slip out of the bridal suite and run all the way to the groom's suite. Seb opens the door and sweeps inside the room, saying, Tardier. Presenting the male homo sapiens. God damn it. I survey the carnage. 
The room stinks of alcohol and vomit, and the groomsmen are so wasted that they don't even budge at the sounds of our voices. They're all in various states of undress, more than once I have to turn away quickly, my cheeks burning. Um, excuse me, guys, you need to wake up now. Seb laughs. Right, you're gonna wake them up with your little teeny voice. Yo. Guys. Wake the hell up. I jump at Seb's shout, but none of the groomsmen even stir. Are they alive? Seb nods, nudging one of the groomsmen on the leg with his shoe. The groomsman mumbles something before falling back asleep. Inside the marbled bathroom, Tom Cruise Satopo is in a similar state. It's a bathroom fit for Pinterest smooth marble everywhere, the bathtub a luxurious affair set behind a large picture window overlooking the hotel's gardens. I pat Tom's cheek gently. He grunts, but doesn't stir. You need to channel your inner Asian auntie and do a shout that'll make your mom proud. Ha, ha. I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've raised my voice. It's probably the result of being raised by such loud women. I have a natural aversion to raised voices now. You do it, Seb please. Seb sighs, clears his throat, and shouts loud enough to make my ears ring. Tom stirs, blinks a few times, and falls back asleep. I'm about to ask Seb to do it again when movement outside the window catches my eye. Ho lie. Shit. It's big aunt, ma, and fourth aunt, and they're moving the cooler, staggering across the expansive lawn with it, and oh god the cooler must have popped open at some point without them realizing it, because there is a fucking hand sticking out of it. Oh my god. I scream. Tom startles awake. WH what, he rasps, blinking around him and wincing. My head. Nice job. I knew you had Asian auntie within you, Seb says, lifting his palm for a high five, but I rush past him and head for the door. Where are you going? You still need to wake the groomsmen. Just pour water over them. I gotta go. I run all the way down the hallway, holding down my precious camera and camera bag so they don't bounce too hard. My heartbeat is a constant roar in my ears. By the time I catch up to my mom and aunts, I'm breathing so hard I feel like I'm about to vomit out my lungs. Medi, oh good, Ma says, cheerily. You take that corner and lift. What are you doing? I whisper shout. His hands out. I lift the coolers top up slightly and shove Oguan's hand back inside. It's only when it's in that I realize I've just touched his corpse. A shudder runs through my body. Ma, big aunt, and fourth aunt's eyes widen. Oops, Ma says after a second. Must be when we go over that bump, big aunt says. Why are you moving him now? I cry. The fridge getting so crowded, people coming in and out, in and out. I think not safe there, big aunt says. And since got three of us, we think we can carry all the way down to pier. No problem, Ma says. I blink. No problem. Their version of no problem is to struggle with the cooler all the way to the pier with his goddamn hand sticking out of it. The thought of what would have happened if I hadn't spotted them through the window makes my knees buckle. And who knows how many people have seen them. Yes, got three of us, no need your second aunt, big aunt says. Inside me, a star implodes. This. This right here is the real reason why Big Aunt got Ma and Fourth Aunt to move the cooler now, of all times. Because Big Aunt wants to prove that Second Aunt isn't needed. I can just imagine the smug look on Big Aunt's face when Second Aunt finds out that we've resolved everything without her help. Big Aunt will be all, you see? I can handling the thing just fine, you no need worry, and Second Aunt will be all inwardly going fuck you but then outwardly she'll have to smile and congratulate Big Aunt on a job well done. I can't believe my aunt's rivalry with each other is jeopardizing us getting away with murder. Anyway, now you hear, we can definitely move body down to pier, Ma says. Io, Sepat. 
I check the time. Still about 20 minutes left before second aunt is done with the bride's hair and makeup. Jacqueline is nice, but she's not going to be pleased if I completely miss the shots of her getting ready. But then again, a disappointed bride is much better than, you know, getting arrested because you're found in possession of a dead body. And now that we're here, getting back to the kitchen will be just as troublesome. We may as well see this through right here, right now. With a frustrated groan, I take one corner of the cooler. Together, we heave, and the cooler lifts off the ground. We walk as quickly as we can, and with each step, my shoulder muscles burn, and my thighs shriek and beg for me to stop. It feels like an eternity before the pier comes into view, and I nearly whoop with joy at the sight of all those yachts tethered there. Ladies, the yacht organizer calls out as we approach. Can I help you with something? We lower the cooler gently, and I turn to him. We need, gasp, to get on, gasp, a yacht, gasp, back to LA. Sure, hop right on. Oh, thank you, thank you. My family and I make excited faces at one another and lift the cooler back up. Whoa, whoa, what's this, the yacht organizer says. What a douche. He would have seen that we were carrying the cooler down the pier, but has waited for us to pick it back up before asking about it. Prick. Oh, it's baking supplies. My aunt's the baker and we need to get this stuff back to the bakery. There's not much space left in the kitchen. The yacht organizer's eyes narrow. Ah. Caterers. He says it like a dirty word. Sorry, this yacht's for guests only? We stare at him. Is that a question? Fourth aunt says. No? I mean like, it's for guests only. Period. Technically, I'm not a caterer, fourth aunt says, flipping her hair back. I'm the star of the show, so. Oh? I don't know who you are. He narrows his eyes like he's trying to figure out who she is. Why don't you ask your boss who I am? No, wait, it's okay, please don't bother. I say quickly. If Nathan catches wind that yet again my family and I are struggling with the cooler, he's definitely going to get suspicious. We'll just store this in the kitchen. Thank you. The yacht organizer gives us the fakest smile of the year and goes back to tapping on his iPad. Kenapa? Big Aunt says, and I shoot her a look that says later. We struggle back up the pier with the cooler, and when we stop for a breather, I tell them about how Nathan had seen me and Fourth Aunt moving the cooler and how he would definitely think it's weird that we're trying to move the same cooler again. Oh yes, that sweet boy, fourth aunt says, grinning widely. Very true, Medi. I forgot about him. She wiggles her eyebrows. Ma looks back and forth between the two of us. What? What is it? Nothing. I say hurriedly. Fourth aunt wiggles her eyebrows again. Obviously not nothing. What is it? Why you cannot tell your own mama? Ma frowns, apparently hurt that I'm keeping something from her. Ayo, Sanjia, if your daughter doesn't feel comfortable sharing secrets with you, you shouldn't force her. Maybe that's why Medi doesn't want to tell you these things, fourth aunt says. A.W., come on. These sisterly rivalries are going to be the death of me. Plus, I tell Ma a lot of things. Okay, yes, I did keep my three-year relationship from her, but that's different. I tell her everything else. I'm as close to her as any daughter can be. I'm the good, filial one, remember? I want to shout. I stayed behind while everyone else left. So maybe I don't tell them everything but what more do they want from me? It's nothing. He's just someone I used to know. Anyway, we've got bigger problems right now. I gesture to the cooler. Maybe we should focus on this. Yes, Medi is right, you two can talk about where you failed as a mother later, fourth aunt says. 
for the love of God. Ma, I don't keep any secrets from you, you know that. Aside from Nathan. Literally the only secret I kept from her. I mean, I even told her about me killing Aguan. That's got to count for something. Ma doesn't meet my eye. I do everything for you, and this how you repay me. Bejitu Ya. What did I do to deserve such unfilial child? Here we go. This is so not the time. Then when is the time? After we get rid of the guy I killed. Oh God. I didn't mean to say it quite so loud. But really, nobody drives me quite as nuts as Ma and my aunts. We all look around to see if anyone's heard, but luckily, the place is relatively deserted. Please, Ma, can we shelve this for now? I will tell you everything later, I swear. I desperately want to tell you, Ma, I really do, but now, let's focus on cleaning this up, okay? With a sigh, Ma's shoulders sag. Okay, she says in a small voice. Where we take cooler now? Back to fridge. Big Aunt shakes her head. Cannot, too many people. The head chef driving everyone crazy, people rushing in and out of fridge, looking here and there for truffle la, for rosemary la, for this for that, just matter of time before somebody open cooler. My phone boops with a text. Seb, 10.43 am, there is way too much vomiting going on right now. Can we switch, please? Me, 10.44 a.m., I'll switch with you later. I'm in the middle of something. Seb, 10.45 a.m., you're not in the bridal suite. Where are you? She's not going to be happy if you miss shots of her putting her veil on. Me, 10.46 a.m., it's an emergency. On second thought, can you cover for me? Go take pics of the bride. Sounds like you're not getting any good ones of the groom anyway. Seb, 10.47 a.m., excuse you, I am getting fantastic shots of the groom and his idiots. He sends a photo of some guy with his head in the toilet. Behind him, another guy is taking a shower, fully clothed. Me, 10.48 a.m., go to the bridal suite. I'll see you in a few. I stuff my phone back into my pocket and take a deep breath. We're running out of time. 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 It's time. I cry. The others look confused. Check in time. Remember. They told us our rooms won't be ready until 10. It's past 10. I could cry with relief. We'll be able to store the cooler without worrying about someone stumbling across it. Maybe we'll be able to get out of this unscathed.